Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments. Alamance County is pleased to present the Alamance County Commissioner's Meeting. call the meeting to order. This is the um, August 3rd, 2020, 9 a.m. meeting of Alamance County Board of Commissioners. I'm Chair Amy Scott Gailey, and today with us we have Vice Chair Steve Carter, Commissioner Bill Lashley, Commissioner Eddie Boswell, and Commissioner Tim Sutton. Um, before Commissioner Boswell uh, gives us the invocation, I just wanted to make a note today at the beginning of the uh, meeting that we have space limitations today. The uh, commissioner, the Alamance County Board of Commissioners has never gone to a Zoom meeting format, an all online format. We have always continued to meet in person, and today is no exception. Um, but uh, today we do not have the use of our overflow room, which we usually um, have when we have uh, extra people, you know, for it to accommodate the public or to accommodate uh, members of the media. So they're using that for the courts today because it's uh, 9 in the morning and it, I guess at 9 30 they're going to start court in there so we don't have that uh, we're confined to this space that we're in now so unfortunately we were not un able to accommodate the media being in here today but we are live streaming this meeting so the media and the public can um, view it online and there'll be a, and there's a record of it so that the public can have that later so um, I just wanted to offer that as an explanation from the start because I believe before the meeting there are some questions particularly from the media about media access. And I uh, wanted to explain that the reason is, is this is all the room we have to work with. So Commissioner Boswell, would you please lead us an invocation in the pledge? I'd be glad to. And uh, before I start, I just want to read a Bible verse that's kind of stuck to my heart this week. And uh, this is the Lord responding to Solomon. And he's, and in this thing, he said, in this verse, Chronic, 2 Chronicles 14, he said, and if my people are called by my name, become humble and pray and look for me and turn away from their evil ways, then I will hear them from heaven. I will forgive their sin and heal their land. Let us pray. Lord, thank you for all the blessings that you have given us here in America to worship, to be free. Thank you, Lord, that you have made this promise that if we call upon your name, that you will heal our land. Our land needs healing. Our hearts need healing. Dear Lord, just be with us today as we go about the county's business. Help us to make the right decisions. Help there to be peace right here in this room today. Lord, thank you for all you've done for us. And these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, so uh, today for public speakers, we, because of the space limitations, we are limited to people um, calling in or submitting email comments and uh, we have two public comment periods in our meeting the first at the beginning of the meeting is for agenda related items and then at the end of the meeting we have a second public comment period for non-agenda related items madam clerk do we have anybody signed up today who wanted to speak on an agenda related item okay um so there being no public speakers on agenda related items there will be no commissioner responses the next item is approval of the agenda i make the motion we approve it second okay we have a motion to approve the agenda by mr basel and a second by mr lashley if there's no discussion all in favor please say aye aye, aye. anyone opposed the agenda is approved um, next item is the consent agenda motion to approve 
Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Carter and a second by Mr. Lashley to approve the consent agenda. If there's no discussion about any item on the consent agenda, all in favor, please say aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? We approve the consent agenda. Okay, the next uh, first presentation is from Sam and Vicki Hunt. Um, they have an update for us about the Burlington Animal Services Facility. And welcome, and we are so glad that you are here. Thank you. We're really glad to be here. Uh, on behalf of the PAWS Board of Directors, oh, he's already got the first slide up. Thank you. <laughs> on behalf of the PAWS Board of Directors and Alamance County's Homeless Animals, thank you for all you've done. When you, we first came to you with this little guy's image saying at that point, without your help, I may only have nine days to live. He was referring to the 5,319 animals euthanized at the shelter in 2001, with only 211 being adopted in a whole year. PAWS formed a study commission with members of this body as participants. They recommended the Pet Adoption Center be built in front of the 1960s shelter to increase space for animals and be a more cheerful, welcoming place for staff, the animals, and the community coming to adopt. Your first yes, your very first yes, to pause was $250,000 to go with the City of Burlington's 250 and pause raised 250 from private citizens, and the adoption center was built. It marked the beginning of a wonderful public-private partnership that continues to this happy day, almost 20 years later. Adoptions went up to almost 1,000 a year when the Adoption Center opened in 2004. It was a good start, but not where we wanted to be. And with the 2008-2009 Great Recession, the intake spiked to almost 8,000 animals in a year, and the adoptions hovered around 1,300. Um, okay. So <laughs> good. Um, we still had that old crumbling shelter with no air conditioning, walls and floors that couldn't be kept clean, and don't let me forget to mention how bad it smelled. I know Eddie remembers that. <laughs> Last week, the old shelter was demolished, and there will be a play yard for dogs in its place. And I know it was demolished because I was there. We now have a brand new shelter building, uh, which consists of a brand new building, plus the renovated and reconfigured adoption center. So the adoption center is in the front and the brand new building right behind. It's really beautiful. And there's um, a rendering, uh, and, and the front of the building does look like that. The county's animal control officers, part of Sheriff Terry Johnson's department, now have an office big enough for them to do their paperwork and a sally port that allows them to drive their truck inside and safely process stray animals. They were in a closet before. There is a new community room that will be used for meetings and education for school children and other community groups a state-of-the-art operating room for spay neuters and other surgeries for shelter animals. It used to be if a dog or a cat came in, had some kind of problem, they were euthanized because we didn't have the resources or the surgery to, to treat them. The animal enclosures are larger. They're made of stainless steel and glass. We have great epoxy floors that all stand up to the daily cleaning that's required in a facility that houses animals. The air conditioning and air handling systems are designed for the health of the animals, staff, and visitors. Okay. Oh, okay, there's some pictures of the new. I'm not very technologically uh, adept. Um, the air conditioning keeps the spread of disease down. There are open areas for the cats. Sheriff Johnson's a cat person, so the cats aren't crammed into little cages like they were for all day. They also have windows to look out, and ca they can act like cats. You can see <laughs> that area where the cat has the whole big picture window there. 
When Jess Arias was hired at the end of 2013 as the shelter director, shelter adoptions began to go up dramatically. And in 2019, we adopted out 5,149 dogs and cats, a live release rate of 92%, which is almost unheard of in a public access uh, shelter, open access shelter. I also want to point out they were achieving really great numbers during all the construction and the displacement while this shelter was being built. Their goal is to try to save them all. And they work with social media, over 60 rescue groups all over North Carolina and nearby states. The intake has been decreasing due to all shelter animals. Everybody that goes out, that 5,149, they're fixed. And they, this has been going on for almost 20 years. So the intake has been, you know, um, beneficially affected by that. In addition, the city of Burlington operates a low-cost spay-neuter clinic out on South Church that PAWS supports financially. It has been in operation since 2010, and it's performed 15,388 spay-neuters so far. This great achievement for the animals in this county is in great part due to you all always saying yes to PAWS and yes to helping homeless animals. PAWS is installing and paying for a four panel recognition piece for the lobby. I put a copy for you all. The first panel, we wanted to thank all the county commissioners, all the Burlington City Council members, the county managers, the city managers of Burlington, Sheriff Johnson, Chief Smythe, Chief Galden from, from the past. This, this plaque thanks everybody for these past uh, 20 years who have been involved in PAWS and making this situation better. And of course, our many donors who've supported PAWS all these years. That's our, la our last slide. You can't read it, of course, but that's what the recognition plaque will look like, and it's, it's beautiful. We have donors that have given us $5 repeatedly and donors that have given us six figures. Um, I also have included an overview of the money PAWS has raised over almost 20 years, which is $2 million at change. And it's all been spent on furthering adoption, spay neuter, and the animals. We have no paid staff, it's all volunteers. In addition to the county's capital contributions, your ongoing annual support of the shelter's operating budget is essential. Each municipality has also been contributing since 2004 on a per capita basis to support the operating budget. The city of Burlington owns and operates the shelter and has always supported having the best facilities and shelter operation possible. The county's contribution of $2.9 million and PAWS $750,000 and the balance coming from the City of Burlington have made this beautiful new facility a reality. It's something we can all be proud of and we did it together. Private citizens working with good government to save animals. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Yeah, does anybody have any questions? I, I just have a comment, Vicki. I was coming in and I heard on the radio that there have been two animals that died in the car over the past week due to this heat. And I think maybe just as a public service announcement, people be aware. Never leave. Right. Anybody. <laughs> animal baby anything yes. in a car it gets to 120. But it, animals are just like humans. Minutes. They gotta, yes. gotta have water and gotta cool off. I just have one question. Do you get good volunteerism from the local veterinarians? Uh, from the vets? Right. Uh, we have a huge volunteer group that really helps with our adoptions. We have three vets that some of them are on a part-time basis. We, I think we have one full-time vet and then a vet, two vets that work part-time. 
and um, no, we don't have vets volunteering. Okay. Anybody else? No. Well, awesome. thank you so much. And um, the the county's money's been paid, right, Mr. Hagen? It has. So we're ready to sail on, right? Eh? We are. Thank you so much. Thank you. More, more achievements. Thank you so much for coming. Um, you know, I have two, three, four, three cats and a dog that I got from the animal shelter in Alamance County, and we just love them to pieces. They are good for you. They good for you. Uh, and Sheriff Johnson's got two cats that came from the shelter. <laughs> we just really support what y'all are We've doing. We've a million dollars for all of it. Yeah, thank you. Thank, thank you, thank thank you for coming. All right, next uh, is Mac Williams. We need to set a public hearing. Morning. How are you doing? Morning. I'm better than I deserve. Thank you very much. <laughs> I uh, am here this morning uh, to start the process for an incentives uh, hearing uh, for a, a, a company that's proposing a facility uh, in Alamance County. Uh, and so I think I'm asking you guys to set a date for the public hearing for Monday, August the 17th, uh, which is your 7 p.m. meeting. Uh, the company that uh, uh, we're bringing forward is uh, United Parcel Service, UPS. Good. And more details obviously will be following in the, in the near future, but at the moment, that's the information that, that, that I'm required to provide. And, and uh, the, the request is to set the public hearing for August the 17th. I will, I will make a motion that we set the public hearing. Okay, Mr. Boswell has made a motion and Mr. Carter has seconded it. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, Mac. Thank, Thank you, Mac. Right. Thank we'll you, see you. Keep we'll working. See you then. Keep hard at it. <laughs> Okay, next we have uh, actually a public hearing um, for the designation of Tabardry Mill in Hall River as a local landmark. Tanya Cattle. Good morning, Commissioners. This is the public hearing we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We're just getting the public input for making Tabardry a lo local historic landmark. Uh, there is Erin is here to do a presentation when y'all are ready for that as well. Um, yeah, I think it'd be appropriate to have a short presentation before we, before I call for a vote to open the public hearing so that people will know what we're having a public hearing about. So come on up. <laughs> Thank you. <clears throat> well, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. And is this the clicker here? Yep. That'll be great. I'm really excited to speak to you today about Cora and Holt Mills, which were collectively referred to as Tabadri Mill through their closing in 1983. Um, it's, these are two mills located in the town of Hall River. And I'm really excited to speak to you today about getting the local landmark designation, uh, specifically on the basis of local industrial and architectural um, significance. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with D3 development, uh, we are known for preserving historic buildings. Uh, I've shown here two different ones. One is the 1880s White Furniture Company um, Mill that is located in Mebane, and then as well as our more recent granite mill, uh, the 1844 mill located in the town of Hall River. Um, and I'd be remiss to not mention our president, Michael Hill, uh, who I'm sure looks familiar to you all. Um, he has extensive experience in the preservation of historic buildings, starting with the American Tobacco <coughs> Campus, uh, which is the largest historic project in the state of North Carolina. So I'm, I just want to give you that confidence that this is what we do, and we're really excited to start on Tabadri Mill. May I say something? I was there. Sure on that campus oh, yes? <coughs> last week oh, and uh, went over to the Durham Bulls is across the street yes and, uh, and then, uh, it is beautiful 
<clears throat> if you go on the north side by the old uh, Bulls Park, you've yes. got the other tobacco warehouses that have been turned into condos or apartments. And it's stunning what they do to these projects. Absolutely. And we're just so excited to be finishing up Granite Mill here. And we moved in our first residence this past weekend. And we're really excited to keep continuing with Tabadre. And May I ask, how many, yes. how many condos or, or apartments are in that project right there, uh, American I, Tobacco? I actually am not uh, sure exactly how many. Okay. Um, because this is actually before D3's time, so this okay. is when Mike, Mike Hill was with Capital Broadcast. How about uh, Granite Broadcast. Mills? How many units are in there? Uh, Granite Mill has 175, and to Badre we're um, projecting 150. And um, the Loss of White Furniture has 156. And so, um, in terms of my agenda today, I wanted to go over the current status of the mills, why landmark designation is really important for this project, um, and then finally, why they qualify on the basis of local significance. Uh, so as we already spoke about, these mills are located in the town of Haw River. They were built in the 1890s, and they are connected by a skywalk. So here I've shown a really neat historical photo, and as you'll see, a lot of this is still intact, and you can still see everything that you see here today. Uh, so as of right now, the uh, Cor and Holt are part of the, or on the National Register as a historic district as of April with Granite Mill. These mills were intrinsically connected because Cor and Holt is where the cotton was spun and then it was finished in a granite mill. It was called the finishing plant. And so this next step is landmark designation. And we're really happy to say that the Historic Property Commission had unanimous approval of it in their July meeting. And um, you know, we hope that we get your support this morning as well. Uh, so landmark designation is incredibly important for us, uh, especially with this project, as each mill has its unique challenges. And what we've seen with Tabadri thus far is that the challenges far exceed what we experienced at Granite Mill. And specifically, it's the lack of infrastructure. So we anticipate having to do great investment in that. Um, through the environmental survey, we discovered asbestos um, and also contaminated soil. <coughs> And finally, just with these mills, inevitably, uh, there's deterioration. And so we no longer want to let this stay and continue um, and fester. We really want to get going uh, through this landmark designation to preserve these buildings. And so here, I just quickly summarize. Uh, these buildings are uh, qualifying the basis of um, local significance based on industrial and architectural as I mentioned earlier and I'll be showing you in the next few slides uh, but most importantly the integrity of these mills is maintain the location setting feeling as I'll prove to you in these next few slides so for the sake of time I won't go through each of these historical events but it's very evident that the town of Hall River was shaped by these mills the life and the culture you know for example um, in 1895, the Hall River became the second largest town in Alamance County after Burlington, in which all the residents were either mill workers or supported the mills. I mean, that's pretty incredible. <laughs> um, and also the fact that we were able to put it on the National Register also speaks to its significance. Um, and moreover, we want to honor this history. And so, in fact, in our appendix, we have some language for a plaque that we hope to put up um, in the case that we do get this landmark designation to honor this history. And now I'm going to move on to the architectural, which is the more exciting. Uh, here you can see a uh, Cora Mill, and uh, one of the most significant features is this zigzag curtain wall. It's a patented wall in which uh, Cora is one of five structures in the U.S. with this wall still intact. So therefore, it's so important that we preserve it. Um, in addition, you can see the decorative brick, and you can also see the skywalk. And moving on uh, to a different angle of Cora, you can see the decorative brick continues, as well as you can see a, a bit over that tree, the front gable roof. Moving on to Holt, Holt has several significant features. Uh, the smokestack, the bell tower, the boiler house, um, the window openings. And then here, this is the dye house, and you can see the sawtooth roof, which actually helped improve ventilation and was very forward for their time. 
And with that, um, that's all I have here. I just want to thank you for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Just out of curiosity, what is the occupancy rate at, at the Granite Mill right now? So at Granite Mill, um, I, we have about 15 or 16 residents that just moved in. Um, so that, that's about it right now, but we'll, we're anticipating to be completely leased okay. up in a couple months. Here. We're going to add to the population of Hall River, Kelly. Yes, absolutely. I think you have your mayor back there. <laughs> hey, Kelly. <laughs> So Were y'all involved great. with the uh, Cone Mills conversion in Greensboro? Uh, no, not in Greensboro. You know, they did the condos and shops, <coughs> restaurants. It's, it's amazing the people that will move in. And, uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Our concentration has just been in the town of Hall River right uh -huh. now. Um, you know, our first introduction to Alamance <coughs> County was the White Furniture Company. Um, but right now we're heavily invested and focused on the town of Paw River and working very closely with Mayor Kelly in that. I'll make a statement on the white furniture one because I got to go there before it was finished when the oh, governor fantastic. came up to look at it and everything. And then I got to go back and visit when the chamber had an open house there and it's beautiful. Yes. So you guys do a really good job. Oh, thank you. I'm so glad to hear. And we welcome you all to return to Granite Mill um, in a few short months when we finish up construction and see what we've done there. It's it's well, really it's incredible. Great to preserve Alamance County history and thank you for helping with that. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. All right, well, great. Well, let's move on to the public hearing now that we've had a presentation so the public is up to date on what uh, we are um, working on, what the public hearing is about. Um, and we're doing this virtually right so for a public hearing in the time of COVID Mr. Albright refresh our recollection about uh, how we do that we advertise it where people are able to call in or submit email and that satisfies the law for a public hearing is that right that's correct okay and um, so we did advertise the public hearing and ask people to call in and submit comments and do we have any Okay, and um, this meeting was not open to the public today to have the public come to the meeting room, but just as a uh, overabundance of caution, I'll ask is there anybody? Oh, wait, we haven't opened the public hearing yet, have not we? Not yet, we oh, okay. open one first. That's okay. All right. I'll move that we open. No, second. second. Okay, Mr. Lashley has made a motion that we open the public hearing, and Mr. Basel has seconded it. All in favor of opening the public hearing, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? All right, so we don't have anybody who has signed up in advance. Do we have anybody present in the meeting room right now who wants to be heard about um, the Tabardry uh, Mill project in Hall River? Can we get the mayor to come and speak? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure. I'll. Come on, Mayor Allen. We're gonna make you. We're gonna have. We're gonna a, make you. We're gonna speak have a public no hearing. What. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, I will tell you that. Um, you know, Tabadri ha uh, that Hall River has 2,400 residents. We are the hometown of three North Carolina governors, Thomas Holt, Bob Scott, and Carr Scott. And this, after the mill closed, we were really decimated. And this project, uh, ever since I've been on, I kept saying if we could just get the mill restored, we could revitalize this town. And that's what we're really looking for, is to revitalize the town. And there's going to be two restaurants in the granite, uh, more of a family and more of a higher end and there's also going to be a coffee shop in there too but uh, we're really excited about it we're hoping it's going to really revitalize and bring our town back uh, because we just sat idle for 20 years with nothing happening and we've got to have a tax base and and residents and sales tax so we're really excited about it and I think it's a big step yes, in the right direction sir a big step in the right direction yes sir sure is we are really thrilled over this and Mike Hill's done a wonderful job and he's been great to work with also I think it's great that we can give these companies some historic tax credits because mm -hmm. without it I don't know how they would even do it so yeah. I think it's a great yeah. thing that I know uh, Steve Ross pushed real hard a couple years ago to get that keep that in the General Assembly to uh, to extend it for credits. four years, yeah. uh, which is why Tabadri is going to happen without it. It would not have even happened so without those important. historic tax yeah. credits. 
and we are the oldest town in Alamance County too. We were established in 1745. Yeah. So we really that. thank and appreciate you for all of your support and help. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. Well, we need a vote to, if there's nobody else who wants to be heard, then we would need a vote to close the public hearing. So moved. Okay, Mr. Lashley has made a motion to close the public hearing and Mr. Carter has seconded it. If there's no discussion, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, the next item on the agenda <coughs> is uh, to consider approving the local landmark designation for Tabardry Mill. Motion to approve. Second. Second. Okay, Mr. Carter <laughs> has made a motion to approve that designation and Mr. Lashley has seconded it. Is there any discussion? I'd just like to echo what uh, has already been said that this is really a great and important project for the town of Hall River. Um, I had the opportunity, Erin invited me to come and see the property and, um, and I'm excited to see what happens. It was a privilege to be able to go and see it the before and I'm looking forward to seeing the after and um, it's going to be a great thing for Hall River. So um, if there's nothing else anybody wants to say, then uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, and the next item on our agenda is a reimbursement resolution for some ABSS bond projects. Is uh, Dr. Thorpe here? We'll fetch him from the back. Dr. Thorpe, how are Welcome, you, sir? sir? Good hey. morning, good morning. Good morning. Hey. Kind of strange times, a little different times, kind of hard to talk to them, man. That's right, that's right. <laughs> but we'll make it work. How about that? That'll work. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. Um, to give you a little background information, we took uh, the South Melbourne project out to bid July 22nd, uh, or came in July 22nd. At 3 p.m. is a single prime general construction bid. Uh, Bloom's construction came in at with a base bid of 6.1 million. Without alternates, it was about 6.3 million. We had budgeted about 6.5 for this particular job, but and y'all had y'all were able to give us 4 million, I believe, at the last maybe not last meeting, maybe the meeting before that. But now that we have some change in times and we have about nine weeks without students in the building, we're going to be able to get a lot more work done, which is going to push us at that four million or over that four million. So what we come here to request is that advancement of the two point five million as a reimbursement that we reimbursed that to sell the bonds. And also, I have the opportunity to capitalize on a really, really good price. Good time to do it if you don't have are children good. in the way. <laughs> yes, sir. No children. That's right. Nine yeah. weeks. There's a lot of work that can happen in that nine week period. I'll move that we approve that. Second. Okay, um, let me read that, it first. Uh, we have a, it's one of those where we have the caption to be read. So maybe right. if Mr. Boswell okay. makes the motion, then somebody can second okay. it. I would move that we do this resolution of the Board of Commissioners for the County of Alamance, North Carolina, declaring its intention to reimburse said county from the proceeds of one or more tax exempt financings for certain capital expenditures, which is what you're presenting. Yes, sir. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Lashley. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Great. Thank you. Thank you. All right, the next item on our agenda is an update about the uh, Alamance County criminal justice system. Justice system. And um, I had asked for this item to be put on the agenda because we've had a lot of concern in recent months from the community about um, interactions between the public and law enforcement officers. And some of the concerns that have been raised are things that have been um, worked on for quite some time in Alamance County. There's uh, initiatives in other parts of the country to have uh, mental health professionals to respond when um, 
when the officers are called out and Alamance County has been working on that in a program called the Stepping Up Initiative and the construction of a diversion center related to those things. That's been going on for a while. Um, we also have a pretrial assessment program that Alamance County has been putting um, a lot of effort and energy into. And then there have been questions raised of the sheriff about his training, how he trains his officer, and there have been requests for um, policy reviews from um, different members of the community. So we're given the, these uh, initiatives, these programs, the floor today so that public can be better aware and better informed about what's really going on. Um, um, so I just want to make it crystal clear that the sheriff does not report to this board. The Alamance County Board of Commissioners, no board of commissioners in North Carolina ha is a supervisor of a sheriff's department. Um, he is an independently elected official and he alone is responsible for the policies and procedures of his department. Um, we do set, we do allocate a dollar amount for his budget, but he is at liberty to use the money, you know, in whatever way that he sees fit. It's the same kind of thing we have with the school system. You know, we get, we set the school system's allocation from the county funds. Um, and then the school board decides how they're going to do it. Just like the school board is an independently elected uh, authority, and we don't dictate or boss around or tell the school system how to do the, operate the schools, we don't dictate, boss around, or tell the sheriff how to run his department either. But that being said, um, we do work closely with the sheriff and try very hard to support him and make sure that he has the resources that he needs and we want to give him the opportunity and others who have been working on these initiatives the opportunity to um, tell the public more about what's been going on in the area of uh, criminal justice reform in Alamance County for the past five years or so or more. So um, I think first we're going to hear about the Stepping Up program and Linda Allison. Sure. Thank you Commissioner Welcome. Gailey and good morning. Good morning. Good to see you all. Um, we do um, are privileged in Alamance County um, to have a stepping up initiative. Um, our initiative in Alamance County actually began by this board again in um, 2015. Um, a resolution was passed um, to make Alamance County a stepping up initiative county. Um, the work um, began shortly after that, um, I'd say early 2016. Nationally, just so you'll know how large this movement is, there are about 544 counties nationally that participate in Stepping Up. This is a partnership between the National Association of Counties, the American Psychiatric Association, as well as the um, Council of State Governments. Um, in North Carolina, there are 47 counties currently um, that have signed on, and I want to think that we were one of the original 10. Um, our work began very early on. In Alamance County, we're actually working with 30 or more organizations as part of this Stepping Up initiative. So it is not only a Sheriff's Office initiative, but as well, um, it is um, a community initiative. Um, the Alamance County Stepping Up initiative is housed in the Sheriff's Office and supported by the Sheriff's Office greatly um, with oversight, admit, excuse me, advisory oversight from the Justice Advisory Council. You all know about the Justice Advisory Council. You actually approved the Justice Advisory Council um, when it was um, created in 2017, and that is a commissioner-appointed board. Um, there is a list of some of the um, voting members, um, actually most all voting members of the Criminal um, Justice Advisory Committee that we call our Justice Advisory Council. Um, so again, we work for the sheriff, um, and this initiative is out of the sheriff's office with advisory oversight by the Justice Advisory Council. Um, as I said earlier, we have been very um, purposeful since the very beginning to make this a community issue. A commu it is a community issue. We wanted to make it a community um, initiative. And so we have created from the very beginning an avenue for the wider community to participate in this. Um, in September of 2016, we had a two-day dialogue that was held with over 75, um, I believe this is actually a picture from that, I see. Um, Chris Burdick in there, so it's been a while. This was September 2016. 
um, when we had um, a two-day dialogue and we had over 75 um, county um, participants included and we took information from them about the criminal justice system overall in Alamance County where the gaps were, where the needs were, and um, that was a very successful um, two days. And from that we formed committees for the Stepping Up Initiative, about four committees that started working on things like training, um, they started working on um, doing work within detention center to improve services to mentally ill and lots of other things. I'm happy to say we actually followed up three years later with another community initiative that we held in September, excuse me, October of last year. It was called a sequential intercept mapping process. Um, there have only been about four or five counties across the state that have done that. It's a national model and we were one of those counties. Um, so um, I'm really excited. But just as a reminder, the four um, national stepping up goals are simple. They're to reduce the number of mentally ill that are booked into jail, to shorten the time that they spend in jail, um, as far as jail days go, to increase the connection to services and to reduce jail recidivism. Um, and that is, in a nutshell, again, what this initiative does. And we are working in all four of those areas. Um, I won't belabor it today, but just if you have specific questions, We've done lots and lots of work there. I'm just going to hit some highlights today. Um, this is a statement that was in the 2017 report by North Carolina Disability Rights in North Carolina. It says a number of law enforcement agencies have recognized the dire need for mental health and substance use disorder services in local detention centers. Some county and state officials have made efforts to improve mental health services in their jails, including implementing stepping up programs, creating behavioral health units, and instituting pilot programs for providing substance use treatment in jail. These programs highlight the need for statewide action to improve mental health and substance use disorder treatment in North Carolina jails and illustrate that such programs can be affordable and effectively implemented. I'm happy to say that we've done all those things in the Alamance County Detention Center um, or are in the process of working on those. Um, and the other thing I would want to say, um, actually go back to that, um, Sheriff Johnson started his, um, sounded his alarm more than 20 years ago, I would say. Um, he came out when we still had a mental health system actually in place in Alamance County. Um, he and, and, uh, raised an alarm about the numbers of mentally ill who are being housed in the jail. And um, quite alarming um, is that some jails in the nation actually house more mentally ill than the largest state hospital in their state. Um, so it's quite, quite, quite an alarm. Some of the highlights of what we have done um, over the last year, um, I'm happy to say more than 200 um, law enforcement officers, including some of our detention staff and officers, and more than 20 EMS staff have been trained in the um, crisis intervention team training, um, CIT trained, and um, to respond to mental health crises. Um, when Stepping Up was formed, we went to all of our um, law enforcement chiefs as well as our sheriff and we said we have to set um, a benchmark. What would you say? Would you say 20%? You want 20% of your workforce to be trained in crisis intervention team training? That's a 40 hour training. Um, and they said no, no, we want 100% of our officers on the street to be trained. So what that meant for us as a Stepping Up initiative, we met with Cardinal Innovations and we decided we needed to have more trainings. At the time there were two being offered per year in the county and one in I think Hillsborough, um, Orange County. And so now we're having a, um, five, five different trainings throughout the year. Um, needless to say, 2020 has been a different year. Um, three of those trainings have already been canceled for this year, but we're hopeful that, that towards the end of the year we'll be able to make up some of that ground. Um, more than 800 community professionals and stakeholders, including court staff, school personnel, county staff, and others have been trained in mental health first aid as a direct result of our initiative um, to recruit, increase both CIT and mental health first aid training. We, um, mental health first aid training, many of you maybe have participated. It's only an eight hour training and it's for community professionals. Um, we have added some certified trainers. They have to go away um, and be certified in a, in a week long school. And the county, um, through the Stepping Up Initiative, invested in paying for some of that training. So we have four to five um, certified trainers. Um, some of the other highlights um, of our initiative, just to name a few, um, positions supported by the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. 
We have two um, sworn officers, um, a sergeant and a corporal, who, um, back to Commissioner Gailey's comment about co-responders, mental health co-responders, they basically are a team of CIT skilled officers, and they basically are out in the field handling primarily mental health calls. Um, and that, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in just a minute, but that has proven quite successful. Burlington Police has what's called a co-responder model where they pair a mental health professional with a police officer and go out in the field together. That's the model they're using and that one works quite well, quite well. Um, a clinical social worker was added in our jail. Um, the sheriff graciously, graciously agreed to um, take two of, at the time, vacant. Um, jailer positions and reclassified that into a licensed clinical social worker in detention which was critically needed. Um, so this person works for early identification of mental illness, screening and treatment as well as re-entry planning. We want to make sure if they're in the jail today we can do everything we can do to make sure they stay on their meds and they're not going to return to jail. Um, you're going to hear a little bit more from Steve Ginter in just a little bit but as part of our stepping up initiative we did have funding to run a 12-month pilot project of a pretrial um, release or pretrial supervision program that was to divert low-level mentally ill offenders from jail to treatment. If they sit in jail and spend 21 days for time served for a crime, they're probably not getting a lot of treatment. But if they can spend one or two days and then we can get them out under supervision for two or three months and they can be basically comply with their treatment program, then there's a greater likelihood they're not going to return. Coordination with county planning team, um, as, as Commissioner Gailey again referenced, you all know about the 24-7 um, Diversion and Restoration Center, Mental Health Crisis Center that we have planned. Um, you all graciously agreed a few years ago to dedicate the building at 1946 Martin Street for this purpose. Um, Cardinal Innovations donated um, in early 2018. Um, 1.2 million dollars in funding to renovate that building. Um, we are anxiously awaiting the day that we can do that. We also have worked with RJ Healthcare, which is the contracted crisis um, provider of mental health services, um, to expand their hours currently to weekends. Um, and so that is something that's quite exciting for us. Additional, again, I'm not going to hit everything we've done, um, just the highlights. Um, I mentioned early how critically important the crisis intervention team training was for this community. Um, and we identified early on that we needed to have our own local steering committee for crisis intervention team training. We did not currently, when we started stepping up, have a local one that, that we had people who were participating in the regional one, I believe, at Orange. <coughs> Um, but we now have a law enforcement run crisis intervention team training steering committee um, and that has greatly strengthened this program. They meet after every training to say what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to change, what are we doing you know, for our officers, what, what, what needs to change and so that's been very well. Again we added a pretrial services um, supervision committee and put that in place to plan for this program, this pilot that we wanted to do. Um, that committee started meeting in August of 2018 and that included all of our judges, the DA, defense attorney, sheriff, commissioner, um, our detention captain, um, and lots of people working um, locally to, to revise some of our criminal justice system elements. Um, formation of the Justice Advisory Council, we've already talked about that. That basically merged the Family Justice Center Advisory Board and the Stepping Up Leadership Team into one, and that was in 2017. We have um, enhanced data tracking, not only in the Sheriff's Office, but we're collecting data from across the county for CIT training um, of officers. Um, so that's been a result, direct result of stepping up that we're tracking um, and, and monitoring some of our data with regard to mentally ill in jail and services across the community. We have applied for um, a 2020 um, Bureau of Justice grant, the grant that I have been employed under um, and, and this work that we're talking about actually um, is closing out. That was a three-year grant and we got a partial year no-cost extension. Um, but we applied for another grant that actually if we received that from the Bureau of Justice, that would work to expand the crisis center um, hours at RHA crisis. Um, right now they've just expanded to, from 8 p.m. every day, they've expanded to weekend hours as well. Before we had no weekend hours, they're now open eight hours, uh, excuse me, 
from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. on weekends, and this would expand it, we hope, to, to include up to midnight. We're getting closer, ever closer to that 24-hour <laughs> diversion center. Um, we also would be adding what's called a peer support specialist in the detention center under contract. That would be a contract position. And that person would work directly with mentally ill and or mentally ill substance users who are leaving jail to, to make sure they stay in treatment and that they are able to get the appropriate housing and services that they need so they don't go back on the street into the same environment they came from. Um, I spoke earlier about the sheriff's office having two two um, sworn officers, a sergeant and a corporal position that do crisis intervention team response to mental health calls. Um, in a three month period alone, um, I think this is 123 calls that they responded to. Of those, 78 of those were resolved on the scene, meaning they took care of it in themselves. Um, another 14 of those were voluntarily um, transported um, to a facility like RHA or somewhere. 31 percent of those were involuntarily committed um, and, and appropriately transported there and in this particular three-month period of 2019 there were no arrests. Excellent. Um, yes. That's great. These are mental health calls and this is our um, crisis response team in the sheriff's office. Not even data from across the county but just our sheriff's office and the sheriff may say more about that later. Um, I think over a nine month period to give you another example um 55 percent of those over a nine month period were resolved on the scene meaning nothing further was required um they were referred to treatment and that kind of thing as i said we are tracking data when we came in and began stepping up we didn't even have a baseline we we knew we had a lot of mentally ill in jail but we did not know how many um and so we started working really hard with um our IT um, staff and others to put systems in place and the sheriff graciously agreed to purchase a software program for us um, at little expense but it helped us to be able to track that data it was called crystal report so for last year um, our mental health screen positive rates that means out of all the inmates in a jail in these particular months this is 2020 but compared to last year so for 2020 our screen positive rate thus far is 21 percent it's, it's down, um, obviously our, our jail population overall has been down during COVID, um, but compared to last year, we're now sitting on about a 30% average for 2020 after two quarters as compared to last year was 36%. But if you look at the 2019 average, basically you can understand what our officers are dealing with in detention. We're basically talking about, you know, one, uh, excuse me, yeah, almost a third of more than a third of our inmates having mental illness and that just again escalates the level of intervention that's required um it will come as no surprise to you that during this um covid crisis there's another crisis that's looming across the united states and that is the opioid epidemic which was already bad um, opioid abuse is not going away and has actually surged during the um, recent covid crisis um, as you know, that's been on the radar again for a long time and we have a local group called AC Hope um, that has worked on this since 2017. There have been several um, large community leadership forums that have been held and they were already in the process of working on um, systematically addressing the opioid crisis in Alamance County. Most recent data, according to Ray, um, director of EMS, were that from March 1 through July June, excuse me, June 30th, that's about four months, um, EMS alone administered 83 doses of Narcan. Um, as compared to last year during that same time period, there were 60. Um, our officers are dealing with much the same. Um, they are all trained on the use of Narcan and how to um, administer that and carry that with them um, at this time. Um, I would again refer you to um, data from Alamance um, AC Hope if you need additional information. AC Hope is housed within the health department, the local health department, and um, they work closely with RHA um, crisis as well as EMS um, and some other county leaders on, on that. Um, I want to talk now a little bit about our um, Alamance County pretrial supervision program. 
Um, we, again, through our grant, had funding to support a 12-month pilot. Um, it was going to be a co-responder um, program, but when we, the sheriff came back from San Antonio, Texas, when we took a group of 16 down there, and he decided, I don't want to wait. I want to go ahead now. I want to put some officers on the street to deal just with mental health calls. So after we got those two officers in the field on the street handling the mental health calls, we realized we probably didn't need our own co-responder program in the sheriff's office. So we wanted to take that money, that grant money, and do something a little different. So we started meeting um, with our judiciary and some others, and we formed a committee. Um, and that committee began meeting, I think, as I said, August, September 2018, somewhere there. They helped us develop and frame what that program would look like, um, what that pilot program would look like, and um, were very instrumental in getting that started. So Alamance County's been at this for quite some time. The timing was perfect that in um, January of 2019, last January, we were invited, one of 18 counties across the state invited to Raleigh to participate in um, Attorney General Josh Stein's roundtable on pretrial release. Um, so we took again a team, and they're listed there, everyone who participated, um, to Raleigh. Um, and we spent a whole day together, um, not only hearing from other people across the state about what they were doing in their counties, but we met in the afternoon as a team and sat down and talked about what ours would look like. Um, we came back that very next week and started first appearances for misdemeanor defendants. That was not currently going on in the county. They were having first appearance for felonies at the time, but not misdemeanors. So we, again, began actively working. Um, I'm going to turn it over to... Um, Steve Ginter. Steve is our pretrial release case manager and he has been employed with the sheriff's office since April of 2019. And so um, I will let him do this. Do you want me to put it? Okay. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioner. Welcome. Good morning. Um, just a brief background mm -hmm. about uh, so I started in April of 2019. Um, the weekend before, I was a probation officer for almost 30 years and now I'm semi-retired and thankfully the sheriff has taken me on uh, with this role. It's been a group, group effort to do this program. Um, it's not just one person doing it, it's the judges, the clerks, the sheriff's staff has been fantastic to work with, the DA's office. Um, it's just really a group effort, everybody putting this together for mental health, low risk offenders. Um, so I want to go through what the slides say. The first slide talks about the, the committee, what they feel like this program benefits. It's increased public safety. It's freed up the DA's office to focus, focus on serious offenders. It's reduced the numbers of uh, failures to appear. It's also reducing the recidivism in the criminal justice system. Um, reduction in involuntary commitments and emergency department visits. This next slide, I will go ahead and tell you there's one correction that should be made. The 75 should be 71. Um, so currently, this is going through that, those dates, October 1st, 2019. That's when the new software that I've been able to utilize um, called C Pretrial Program, which allows me to, to monitor uh, various things from their success to them making calls. I have them making calls every Wednesday. Um, it also sends them a court date, reminding them when they're supposed to appear. Uh, so it's pretty very useful for me to, to be able to monitor. So as far as the success rate during that period of time, I've had 35 people complete the program, meaning they, they uh, do whatever the requirements are. Could be going to a mental health provider, getting on the medication, um, calling me every Wednesday, not getting new charges, just various things with that. There's been five terminated cases during that period of time where they did not successfully complete it. And uh, again, I guess it's 31 actually were successful and 35 currently in my on my caseload, which has sort of increased during this time frame. Um, mainly simple assaults have increased during this time period, which you guys could probably imagine has occurred. This speaks to, well, it doesn't show the actual names. So going down to the very top, um, failure to appear for larceny, failure to appear for marijuana, failure, failure to appear for driving charge, Simple assaults, you can see that's the longest line um, that has increased. Misdemeanor larcenies, disorderly conduct, communicating threats, um, violation of the 50B order, which that was done by a judge. 
um, possession of marijuana, intoxicated and disruptive, and then just a driving while license revoke charge, carrying a concealed weapon, and break and entering. Those are the kind of uh, offenses that I'm, I'm looking at mostly. Um, sometimes I do get involved with felons, but not very many. The last slide basically goes over the success of the program. Um, if you look, it says 100% maximum for most of it, but the second column says 11. So the first, the first line is for uh, keeping their court date. So it's been almost 100% that they've kept their court date. And I, I think that's partially due to the software reminding them um, about their court date. Uh, the next one is the average is only one, almost two days in jail. So, and that's partially, uh, you know, I'm able to usually get them in court the same day that I see them. Um, of course, with it being a weekend, sometimes that adds to that time. But the longest one is 11, 11 days was the maximum. Um, the safety rate, as you see there, is 94.9. Um, that's meaning people have not gotten new charges or got received new arrests during the time that they've been under my supervision. Um, the success, success rate is 86, or I'm sorry, 81.6 percent, and that's where they've actually done everything they need to do. Oftentimes they get a uh, dismissal, and that's very obviously very useful for them, especially if they have driving charges because it doesn't go against them. And that's pretty much it in a nutshell. What's your current case code look like? I have about 35 active cases right now. That sounds to me like a pretty significantly low number. Would I be correct? It's I'm part time right now. Um, it. I don't. I, I mean, I talk to a lot of people. Some don't qualify for various reasons. Right. Some people don't want to be in the program. Um, and understand, I'm not being critical. I understand. I'm just saying that sounds like you're managing the number to a very manageable level. Right. Which sounds like a positive thing to me. So, so I work Monday through Thursday, right now. Now, are they in what day are they in court typically for these cases? Do they have a different court date from? It the does normal? vary. It does vary. Of course, they oftentimes they get an, an attorney. And through this epidemic, those cases have been moved out, too. Sounds good. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. I like that safety rate, too, 94.9%. That sounds, that sounds extremely high. Yeah, thank you for coming today, Steve. I think that this is a really amazing program that um, I've, I've uh, participated in these uh, committee meetings with the Justice Advisory Council and also um, the pretrial assessment program little mini committee right and um, I've just been really impressed by you and your work well, you. and the impact that you've had on the people in the program I remember it was a was it a stepping up initiative update where we had a young lady came and yes. talked about the impact of the pretrial assessment program on her life and it was really remarkable how much it meant to her that she had been in trouble a lot for a long time and yeah. um, I can even say that she called me and said she went to the beach for the first time and wasn't high Wow! and it really meant I mean she sent me pictures of Halloween you know she's still connecting with me and it's really really helped her out a great deal yeah That's great. so this is um, one of those this is a program that transforms people's lives and one of the I think um, Great things is when we can see the potential in the person in front right. of us and then work to help bring out that, help them realize that potential within them. And some people need more support. Correct. And this is a program that can give that support to people who are really at a very, very low point in their lives. So yeah. thank you very thank much you. for your work. We really appreciate it. They have done an outstanding job, mm -hmm. believe me. Yeah, Linda works so hard. <laughs> she works so hard. Well, I think we, we ought to note, too, that the sheriff has commented to me a number of times that he will not retire <laughs> until this program is fully implemented. I mean, we have a group outside making some comments that if they really understood what he's up to and what he's trying to do in this community, if they really knew and understood they probably wouldn't be saying what they're saying well that's why we're here today is that's to right. yeah. help make sure that they at least they can't say that they didn't have the opportunity to know and understand exactly we're giving them the opportunity today thank you uh, I'm gonna be talking to you a little bit about Alamance County Sheriff's Office uh, the things that we're trying to do certainly 
since 1849, we have the same core values that this agency has always had. Uh, unluckily that uh, maybe the finances weren't there to do some of the things back years ago that we're trying to do now. But in the long run, what these two are doing here and what we're trying to put together in this county will save the taxpayers money in the long run. I've made this statement many times before that I run the the uh, largest mental health hospital <laughs> in Alamance County, and that's the Alamance County Jail. And that's why these people, what they're doing is so important, folks. Okay, policy training. Alamance County Sheriff's Office is committed to providing professional law enforcement and detention services. During the year, the Sheriff's Office, by the way of detention staff, processed 8,544 individuals being booked in the Alamance County Detention Center. And you can see, they, they have their hands full because they're looking at everyone that comes in that detention center. These bookings don't run down the same individuals, booked multiple times throughout the year on different arrests, but most are unique persons. Alamance County Detention Center has established a number of programs, some which you just heard about a minute ago, addresses and benefits offenders in an attempt to reduce recidivism. Let me tell you something. We have constantly what I call frequent flyers that come to jail, get out of jail, right back in with two to three days. A lot of these individuals are the mental health uh, individuals that we're talking about. And if we can address those issues uh, on mental health, then they will probably not be coming back in that detention center. Next few slides are just a few examples of the initiatives we're trying to do in our detention center. How much County Sheriff saw the Alamance Community College? We got together in 2015 and develop what we call the general education, uh, excuse me, uh, general education development, GED. Any inmate that's in that jail for a period of time that wants to get their GED can do it. The opportunity is there. We partner with the Alamance County uh, Community College to bring this about. And uh, we have had uh, several individuals that go through that and have graduated. These classes require inmates to take the GE test. Classes provide valuable education, information regarding all of the five main topic areas in the education wing. Math, language arts, was reading, language arts, writing, and social studies and science. Those individuals, and you say, well, Sheriff, why did, why did you want to get a GED program in a jail? Well, let me tell you something. If you were an employer, and you had an individual that had gone to jail and done nothing but laid there in jail for a period of time, trying not to improve themselves, or you got an individual that come that went into got made a mistake, went into the detention center, but then wanted to turn their life around and they put their efforts in getting their GED. Which one would you hire? The one that did exactly that. And that is so important to give these individuals, I think, an opportunity. And this goes on. All participants must first take an assessment test to inform the GED instructors of the areas inmates need to focus on in order to pass the GED test. Once the inmate completes the required cl classes and successfully passes the GED test, they are presented a diploma for completion and an actual graduation. To see the faces of these individuals that are graduating is unbelievable. <clears throat> The sense of accomplishment is evident on the face of those who complete the GED program. Oftentimes, this is the first time they have successfully completed an educational course and where someone has showed that they actually care about their accomplishments and success. Think about it. How did you feel when you graduated from high school? Or how did you feel when you graduated from college? And how did those individuals that did not graduate, how do you think they felt? Here's the last graduation. Here's two of the individuals that graduated. And you look at the faces. They're very proud and have a right to be because they are trying to turn their lives around. Uh, every graduation, we provide them with the cap and gowns and official graduation ceremony. And uh, they're very proud. And when they go out, they have something to look forward to. Mm -hmm. We also involve the alcohol anonymous program. The alcohol anonymous classes allow inmates to share their experience, strength, and hope with each other that they may solve their common problem, which is the desire to stop drinking. The primary purpose is to teach individuals to stay sober and help other alcoholic 
achieve sobriety. This is very important because I would say probably 90% of the individuals in our detention center uh, are either gotten involved with drugs and committed crimes result of drugs or alcohol. And uh, so this is very important. Diamond County Sheriff's Office began the AA program for male inmates in 2015 and for female inmates in 2016. The program addresses the issues of abusing alcohol and provides the support and resources to become sober and be successful in a productive system when they are released. So far, 1,930 two inmates have participated in the program since 2015. If we can only get 200 of those to stay clean, we have still saved taxpayers money and helped them become successful citizens. Another program we have in there, we work with the Men of Steel, and I know all of y'all heard of Men of Steel, fantastic program. Men of Steel program is an eight to 10 week course that is offered to male inmates that have been sentenced or awaiting trial. This program is a religious-based program that helps inmates with their spiritual needs. This program consists of studying the Bible along with a workbook and some occasional homework. Guest speakers often come in to speak with the class offering testimonies and advice on changing their lives to become productive citizens through religion. Since the program began, 41 inmates have graduated from the Men of Steel. If you have never attended one of the Men of Steel banquets, you need to do that mm -hmm. to see how important this program is. And that man has a lot to do with the men of steel here in Alamance County. And we appreciate that, Clyde. Change the New Beginnings program. Uh, this is Change the New Beginnings program, similar but different program. It was created for inmates to learn and understand the principles of the Bible. The principles of the Bible. The program also provides encouragement to the inmates on how the Bible can help them. This is a new program that's already had 13 inmates graduate. This is where they can read the Bible. Someone can instruct them on how to understand the Bible. And it has helped uh, inmates tremendously. Now, chapel, uh, chapel ministry program. Chapel ministry expanded in 2015. Chaplain provides spiritual needs to the inmates. Chaplain provides Bibles and approved literature to the inmates. Now, until the coronavirus, the chaplains could come in, visit, and they're going to continue to do that with the inmates on certain time periods that they're allotted. And this is very well received by the inmates. And I think, if nothing else, uh, I believe that uh, we, or I, as sheriff, should allow that to happen or I'm going to be held responsible someday. Mm -hmm. Alamance County Act Program, headed by our community leaders, actively changing together Alamance County has partnered with Alamance County to offer resources and assistance to incarcerated individuals to prepare them, prepare them for their re-entry to society. This is a program that was developed uh, by uh, Michael Graves and Reverend Coven, Ebenezer Church, and they, they have been fantastic to work with. Matter of fact, uh, uh, when even before some of the calls for you know, uh, looking at your uh, policies and procedures, they were already working on that and have since we have sat down and since, and I'll go over some of that in just a minute, and really, really been a great uh, partnership. This Alamance County Sheriff's Office, of course, I'm not going to read all the things, but Alamance County Sheriff's Office currently employs 152 full-time deputies, 18 part-time deputies. These officers are assigned to various divisions within the Sheriff's Office. The list below are the divisions on the operations side of the Sheriff's Office. Quite a few of them uh, you have. It's patrol. We've got six districts, including Green Level. Uh, we got criminal investigations, you see major crimes, frauds, property crimes, special victim unit, domestic violence, which is a big portion of our calls right now. I ICAC, Internet Crime Against Kill Children, and of course our mental health program that uh, Lennon and Steve talked about, which has been very, very successful. And uh, you can see on and on, one thing I like to say, Specialized Investigation, ANET, Alamance County Narcotics Enforcement Team, ATF, we have an officer assigned to alcohol, tobacco, and firearms and explosives. We have an officer assigned to Drug Enforcement Administration. We have an officer assigned to Federal Bureau of Investigation and U.S. Marshal Service Fugitive Squad. Uh -uh. This has been very valuable 
to, to the county of Alamance because what happens in Alamance County don't normally stay in Alamance County and what happens in these other counties certainly don't stay there. We're having a tremendous problem. Human trafficking and your uh, drugs coming from other counties. Matter of fact, we were approached uh, a couple weeks ago by uh, our U.S. Attorney in Greensburg to possibly become a fiduciary for a strike task force. We're catching people here in Alamance County, some of the small lieutenants in these organizations, because we have put so much pressure with those individuals, including ANET, that they've moved their main headquarters over to adjoining counties, <laughs> and they have lieutenants set up here that will they'll ship stuff to and they'll move around. We catch that lieutenant, they just write him off, just put another one in place. So the U.S. Attorney wants us to be able to go into the other counties with the other counties and catch and cut the snake's head off. And we're talking about that this time, but uh, nothing has been totally decided on. As you can see, there's, there's other uh, groups in our organization. Our school resource officers, that's going to be very, very important in the near future. With the way things are going in our society right now, we have got to have some work with our officers and our younger generation coming up. Detention. I'm asking County Sheriff's Office current employees 138 full-time detention officers and seven part-time detention officers. These officers are assigned to various divisions within the Sheriff's Office. Listed below are divisions on the detention side of the Sheriff's Office. Platoons. You have uh, folk tunes, you know, that come in, work 12-hour shifts. So we have special services. We have food services. Of course, that's soon going to change with the new contract, even though we will be involved a little bit that way. We have a medical unit. Maintenance, ICE detention, ICE transportation, U.S. Marshal detention, uh, U.S. Marshal transportation, and state, state inmate transportation. Nobody realizes how many transportation trips we take daily and some on the weekends with all this. And uh, we travel all over the state, taking uh, state inmates to state correctional centers all the way like Dare County, all over the place. And that's time consuming and also uh, costly. During 2019, the Sheriff's Office recorded the following numbers of training hours for its personnel. I'm very proud of our training division. I can tell you right now, if there's an officer that wants to go to training, any training he wants to go to, and it is a good training, I will send them, I don't care if it's to Egypt, because they will bring back that experience here, and that's why it's so important to try to keep our officers here that we have so effectively trained rather than have them leave here and go somewhere else. 4,094 hours of state required training for deputies. That's required. 2,530 hours of state required training for detention officers. Well, above and beyond all of that, we have added additional 13,137 hours of training beyond that which the state requires. I honestly believe we have one of the best trained organizations in the state and not the country. Altogether, this represents a total of 19,761 hours of job specific continuing education for employees. And this year, it's been less because of the coronavirus. A lot of the schools that we wanted to send them to, we could not. But as soon as that lifts, we're going to continue. We're going to do a lot of in house training, but we're going to send officers to the best possible training in the state we can. The following is just a few examples of training that our officers receive. Crisis intervention training, 40 hours. They talked about mental health crisis intervention training. This has been very, very valuable uh, to, to our officers, but more so to those individuals with the mental health problems. The class prepares the law enforcement professional to deal better with people in a serious mental health crisis. It is a police-based pre-booking jail diversion program that trains law enforcement professionals to better understand mental illness, de-escalate people in crisis, and direct them to appropriate care rather than to jail. And believe me, that is real important. A partnership between law enforcement and mental health system and consumers, families, provides many benefits to the communities. Just think of the families, not guarantee you, every one of you up here know someone that has mental health problem, a family with someone in their mental health problem, if not our own and how important that is. And that's why I am pushing so hard to see this diversion center open up. Amen. In
So, Sheriff, um, can we pause on that slide for just a second? Yes, um, ma'am. Because from what I've been reading, there's a lot of concern in the greater community about uh, the law enforcement responding to when somebody's having a, a breakdown of some kind, or you have maybe a special needs young adult who's going through, who's having a bad day, having a crisis, um, or you, maybe you have somebody who is uh, on drugs and not acting appropriately. You can have a lot of different reasons, and there's a big push in the country for um, the law enforcement to to not come out like, you know, to, okay, I'm just gonna arrest you and take you to jail, or using force. That's really, I think, what people are concerned about is using force to sort of physically restrain that person. And um, so, and so they're talking about, you know, how can law enforcement respond to people more compassionately and more, <clears throat> appropriately so what i'm hearing from you is this is something you've been working on for quite some time yes ma'am with your training your officers how to respond appropriately to people who are having a crisis yes ma'am um we we train our officers to de de-escalate the situation and uh, that's very important also our officers are trained to to know what an individual looks like on certain drugs etc then you'll know what you're dealing with but it's so important this crisis intervention training uh, uh 100 of my officers are going to be trained in crisis intervention training i can tell you that because right now with our society the way it's going and with a, a vast amount of, of drug problems and a lot of your individuals that are 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 mentally sick in a lot of ways they turn to drugs and wind up committing more serious offenses. Breaking entrance, armed robberies, uh, you know, uh, dr drug uh, sales, etc. And to, if we can educate our officers, we can help prevent some of those individuals from making it to the jailhouse. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Alamance County Sheriff's Office training. In recent years, mandatory in-service training has covered situational awareness. When an officer goes, you know, what, situ what is the situation, he is able to better understand. Leadership through community policing. I have preached community policing to our county officers. Now, we're not like a city where we can really go out and get it. But I tell my officers, if you ride, you go in those country stores, you talk to those people, you get to know those people. If you're riding and you see an old farmer with his tractor sitting out on the side of the road, stop talking to that individual. You can build relationships within the community. Mm -hmm. To, and those individuals, when there's problems in that community, maybe you can help before it rises to a um, greater height, you can help bring those individuals down. And that is so important, I think. Strategies to improve law enforcement relationships with minority youth. I'm not uh, here to brag, but I'm gonna give you an example. When I first come in office, there was a menace drug problem using 13 and 14 year old kids to hold the drugs and the money out in the green level area. But, and before I ran for sheriff, I realized something's got to be done because you're not catching the older guy and the kid really don't know what he or she's doing. So through some donors here in Alamance County, we raised over 30 some thousand dollars to start a football program out there and that was to buy uniforms. We took two years in a row, these kids, 60 some kids, to the Panthers game. The Panthers gave us uh, free tickets, uh, $20 to each kid to buy, uh, and a lot of those kids, we don't have the problems we have out there now. And that's because we work with the youth, and that's what we've got to do. And it's tough, sort of, uh, the county. If we were in a city, it would be a lot easier in communities. But we are still looking at trying to do everything and bring about new programs to help get those kids to understand we're law enforcement officers but we love you and we are human beings. Equality in policing, improving decision-making skills, long-term effects of childhood of adversity and suicide prevention. These are the, just uh, some of the topics that we've covered. Policy and, uh, policy and uh, training, I want to touch on this real good. 
unfortunate events that have unfolded nationwide have prompted our view of policy and training practices in law enforcement field. We have done that constantly, not just when this stuff happened in our nation. The IMS County Sheriff's Office took the opportunity to review current policy and training practice with recent concerns in mind. Our latest policy and procedure are always publicly available on our website. Anybody want to see our policies, go on the website. Some specific concerns have been mentioned regarding de-escalation classes and training and more mental health awareness. Currently, our officers complete crisis intervention training and mental health first aid courses. They also receive general de-escalation training on an annual basis. We understand that officers need a firm foundation to be successful. We can continuously send officers to job-related training in order to refine their skills. Now, I want to talk about, uh, they were talking about policy. We were presented with 14 things by act, what they would like for us to do. And the other agencies in the county were too. And we have met with some of the other agencies, but I was so proud that of the 14 things they wanted us to look at, uh, 12 of them we were already doing. The, uh, you know, and I'm gonna go over them right now saying, no chokeholds. We've never advocated chokeholds. We advocate in our policy, no chokeholds. Strength, re uh, or vetting, and rehire of any type. Let me tell you something. You get hired by the Alamance County Sheriff's Office, you have undergone one heck of an investigation. And we're the only agency in this county that presents, we have two polygraph operators that after all the investigation is done, they have to pass the polygraph. That polygraph is also very important. If you have a complaint on an officer, we thoroughly investigate those complaints. And if necessary, we will give them a polygraph to the officer or request a complainant to take a polygraph. And you'll be surprised sometimes how like, oh no. You know. <laughs> and I can tell you this, the officer says no, guess what? I no longer need your services. A strenuous view of all complaints, officers, and termination of officer with repeat complaints. We thoroughly investigate every complaint coming in to that office. And it's a headache sometimes, but we do. More training. You've seen what we've done with our training aspect. Basic interactive skills training prior to day one. You see, we do it. Uh, citizen Review Board. This is the only thing we don't have as a Citizen Review Board, but we're working with ACT right now to develop that Citizen Review Board. And uh, the, what I like about it is they will look, we, ain't, we just want to know how many complaints you had filed, did you take action on these complaints? They, they've looked at it in, a, in a, a very important way. And we're working with them right now to get that done. Police officers should be mandated to intervene and report any infraction or violation of law or police procedures that are committed by any fellow officer regardless of rank during execution duty. If I have an officer that does not report an abuse, he won't be an officer of this agency and I will see that he's not going to be an officer of any other agency in this state. Ensure officers are aware of body camera uses and policy. Right now we are testing and looking at body cameras you're looking at probably close to $750,000 for body cameras for all our officers and the uh, where you have to retain the footage. So that's the, been the biggest problem. However, we have in-car cameras in every single car uh, that is on patrol that we have. And they have been very valuable in many situations. Revise the no-knock search warrant. Of course, that, there are certain procedures around the no-knock search warrants that has to be done. Train officers with an emphasis on legal knowledge to prevent violating citizens' rights. Every officer goes through BLET, and if he graduates or she graduates, they better know. And I can tell you, the Sheriff's Office, with my staff, make sure that our people do what they're supposed to do and do it the right way. Community policing and consistent community interaction. You heard what I had to say. Budget for staff appreciation annual. That's what they said. We're looking at trying to do something to recognize our staff. De-escalation training and volatile situation. You see, 
uh, what, what we've done in crisis intervention training. Only two that we really hadn't accomplished is the citizen review board and the in-car cameras. And I can tell you there's plus and minuses on, excuse me, uh, body cameras, not in-car cameras. Yeah. Body cameras, and you say, well, Sheriff, what, what is the negatives? I can give you an example. Several, a uh, couple years ago, we had the protest down here at the courthouse. There was a squabble. Graham had brand new body cameras. And guess all it showed was the semen on the ground. <laughs> semen on the ground. Secondly, officers, and they, they complain, I've heard it, uh, and I agree. If you're going to wear a body camera, if you can turn it on, you turn it on. But officers find themselves in situations sometimes where it's a sudden thing. Maybe I pull him over and, and, and you know, just like a routine traffic, and I walk up and he's got a gun. Or we encounter someone just walking down the street. So we're looking at all these situations on the body cameras. And I, eventually, I think we, if we can get the money, we'll go to body cameras. But I also want the public to understand that sometimes that officers, it's a split second decision you have to make. And you ain't got to hold, don't shoot me yet. Let me turn my body camera on. Yeah, sometimes that's not possible. But it gives a lawyer in the courtroom ammunition to get you. So we're real good in that area. Field training. All officers go through an extensive field training program and process for their release from the field training program. Field training process can last up to 16 weeks depending on the officer's experience level. And sometimes we have had officers go back through it a second time and if they don't make it then, then they go home. They don't work for the Alamance County Sheriff's Office. It involves extensive oversight by multiple field training officers and supervisors who must verify and sign off on the trainee's progress. And that is one of a great, important program. Head of local community is actually changing, and this is basically what I went over here just a minute ago. Uh, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but this is uh, what they act wanted to look at and, re and receive mental health training and a lot of other things. We've only found two that we were not meeting what they see. That's just, uh, I could go on. And we really have a good working relationship with the ACT people. Any questions? How much did you say it would do, cost to do the body cameras? You're probably looking, I'd say, uh, uh, probably five with the, uh, the storage of the uh, information that's come on. Probably looking at 500. What have y'all looked at, Trav? I would estimate, like you said, 500 to 700 thousand uh, dollars. It's a, a massive amount of storage we're going to have to look at, and uh, so we're going to have to get with. Uh, How long do you have to store the video for? Is it a specific time? 30 days, 60 days? I think there's a good. schedule that is attached to what what type of video you've uh, recorded. And you can probably consider a thousand dollar per officer body camera average cost, not just the equipment, but the just the. And I, I've very <clears throat> limited experience, I, no experience obviously with body cameras, but having had some recent experience with uh, the video doorbells, um, very interesting. Those things will store on the cloud, and it transmits from the from the uh, Wi-Fi to the cloud and stores it and then you can retrieve it um, I think to actually undergo the contract per camera it's like five dollars a month I don't know if anything like that's available through law enforcement or not but uh, uh, and I mean high quality video too you can mm -hmm. it was amazing to me how good the video is I, I guess I'm a little confused a lot of this talk about let's defund police and all that and you just said what five hundred thousand to get a body camera yet they want to take away money from the police departments it makes no sense i'm not a real smart guy but I, it doesn't make sense pretty sure <laughs> i don't understand <laughs> can you use civil asset forfeiture money for body cameras yes ma'am i'm sure we could <clears throat> Do we have any more coming in? Asset forfeiture money? 
I hope it, it yeah. is. We're we're seasoning it, but uh, I, I guess the the uh, uh, viruses keep make them keep all our money in Washington. We see <laughs> they say need it. I've talked to uh, our Congressman Walker about getting them to turn loose of some of that money. Okay. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you, Great Sheriff. Great report, guys. Thank you, sir. Thank you very thank much. You. Excellent report. Uh, I got one question for Linda, or maybe oh. Sheriff. <laughs> no. Are there beds available in the state now for putting patients when they come in? And um, you know, I'm not aware of what the actual um, number of beds is. I do know that um, we regularly do transfer people to Central Regional Hospital if we have to but sometimes they are waiting on beds i, I do know, know that especially with the code they are in high demand and, uh, um you know when, again, when everybody's whole, scared of everybody and <laughs> yeah when the whole county um divestiture of local mental health happened right. and it was um they were closing hospitals um i do know that it's increasingly difficult sometimes to uh, to locate a bed as well as the hospitals often wait on a bed to come open hmm. um, um we would have to look to get that number for you that'd as be course. interesting to see i mean okay. with this pandemic going on and oh, how yeah. you know i know it's yes. affected it some but we do um in in many circumstances have to again transport them to central region and i do remember there was a day everybody went to the emergency room and i don't guess you can even take these guys to the emergency room or you can take them um, to the emergency room, um, but that is another thing that our, um, especially when they're not really critically ill, um, that's another thing that our center would do for us, our diversion center. It would allow us to hold them up to 23 hours or so and get a plan in place so that we would not have to take them to the emergency room. That's good. Um, and that kind of thing. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, how about a recess? Sounds good. All right, let's take a 10 minute recess, please. But, uh, come back to order and resume the meeting, please. Uh, the next item on our agenda is the annual settlement, uh, 10 year write off, and order of collection from Jeremy Aikens, our tax administrator. Good morning. Jeremy, how are you? Hey, how are you? How are you? I have a question. Am I socially distant enough to pull this off yes. while I'm talking? Is that appropriate in here? Yeah, yeah, I think it helps us yeah. to hear you. You're okay. <laughs> well, you know, I have a hard enough time speaking clearly without the, the extra muffle. <laughs> and, and I have to say, you know, adapting to the COVID-19, and there's a lot of things I can't wait to be over with. Um, but some things have been very good, uh, one of which has been having the ability to watch on YouTube. Uh, when I'm not in here, I'll be down in my office, pull it up, watch it on YouTube, and that is just very convenient. Uh, in fact, for evening meetings, uh, my wife will watch it on YouTube from home. And I said, surely there is better television than this. <laughs> um, but that's one of those things I hope stays around even after uh, some of the others go. So I've got the annual settlement of uh, tax year 2019. Let me unpack just for a second. All right, and see if the clicker works. Aha, so for 2019, we had a total levy of $88,615,088.81. Of that, we collected $87,415,137.74, with a total uncollected of $1,000,000. $199,951.07. That gives us a collection rate of 98.65. So how does that compare? Is this good? Is this bad? Well, the first thing that you notice is that it is down 0.06% off of last year. And what you're seeing is the effect of the COVID-19 situation. Back on March 17th, we suspended the vast majority of our enforced collections efforts. And when you take your foot off the gas, that's what happens. In fact, I'm actually very pleased with that number that the decrease was so small in light of the situation that we're in. And I want to talk about that a little bit more later in the presentation, but, but that's what we're seeing. I also want to point out last year there was a decrease of 0.2 percent and you know for the first time I had to come in kind of hat in hand and say hey it's, it's down this year and we talked last year about what we thought was causing that and what actions we would take following up 
I do want to report to you about those. I think that we have properly identified. I think we do have some good solutions, which is part of why the decrease this year is not so severe as we had a good first part of the collection season. And I'd like to talk about that as well. If you look at the five-year average, that is 98.68%. So at 98.65, we're pretty much in, in the ballpark. This is a middle of the road year for the last five years. Now, this is a graph of the last 20 years, just to see the trends over time. As you can see from 2000 to 2008, there's a gradual decline in the collection rate. And from 08 to 2019, there's a gradual increase. Obviously, we're off the last two years. And another way to visualize that data is to sort it from the highest rate to the lowest rate. Again, this is the last 20 years. And you can see how this year falls. We're in the upper regions of that uh, compared to a 20-year average of about 97 and a half. So this is still a pretty strong rate um, just in and of itself. Another thing we look at are similar counties. And basically what we do is we take the Department of Revenue's division of counties based on population. In our bracket, it's the largest bracket, 100,000 plus. We pull out the coastal counties and the mountain counties because there's just a lot of differences there. Uh, for example, economies that are much more tourism driven than, than obviously you see here. And of the remaining counties, we classify them based on population and total valuation to get kind of a sense of, of size or scale. We also look at the population density and the valuation density. It's kind of a rough measure for urbanization. Is it more urban? Is it more rural? We also look at median household income and value per population as kind of a wealth measurement. And based on this, the five most similar counties are Davison, Catawba, Rowan, Pitt, and Johnston County. Now, if you compare to those, they have an average of 98.66% while we're at 98.65. So again, we're, we're very much in the ballpark. But I'd like to note that that rate is actually from last year. Because whenever I report other counties' rates to you in these meetings, I'm using their last year's rates because they come through the Department of Revenue, their post-audit certified rock solid rates. And I don't feel that one year's <coughs> difference invalidates the comparison. I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, it can be difficult even if you send out emails to get their current rates. Sometimes you don't get responses. Sometimes you get responses that then don't sort out. If you follow up a year later, it doesn't match back. So I prefer to use last year's rates. This year is different because with the COVID-19 situation, I think it is meaningful to say, well, what did they do this year? I know that's what they did last year, but where do they stand this year? So I took the initiative to send out emails to try to gather that data, which was unsuccessful. I, I did get some responses back uh, but sadly, the, all five didn't respond. I actually got responses from other counties and some municipalities just trying to get data points to look at. And what I did find is out of 12 data points, the average decrease was 0.14%. So a little bit more than, than double the decrease that we saw at 0 0.06. If you limit it to just the similar counties that responded, it's still at 0.14. So that's kind of a a reasonable number to me. So our decrease was more mild uh, than these comparables. But again, that's just 12 data points. That's a very small sample set. Uh, but that's what I was able to get a hold of. But I, I do think that the rate is, is pretty good, all things considered. Now this year we collected $87,415,137.74. That is $12 million more than last year in the general fund. That is 27 million more than five years ago. When you consider we also collect for fire districts and municipalities, and over the course of those five years, we've added Mebane and we've added Gibsonville. Uh, the volume going through our office is much higher than it used to be. And I do want to thank the board for being supportive of our, our office, making sure we have the resources we need to manage that volume. Another thing that I like to look at is the uncollected tax from the previous nine years. So we're always collecting 10 years of taxes. Now, this meeting mostly focuses on the most recent year, but I don't want to forget about the other nine. If we look at the outstanding, which is mostly from last year and then some from the year before and less as you get further back, we have an outstanding of $1,476,000. $279.50, 
But as you can see, it's up a little bit off of the 2018 report. But as a percentage, is the same percentage, just, just because the tax base has grown. Uh, so we're holding that very consistently. Now, I would like to talk about what we did in response to our meeting last year, what changes we've made. And in the meeting last year, we identified one of the real weaknesses is that we were expanding our payment plans. We really believe in payment plans. We talked to other counties that had higher collection rate than ours, and they were using them even more heavily. But what we were finding was compliance problems. And there's really two main categories of compliance problems. So you've got some individuals that from the very beginning have no intention of paying the tax. Uh, they're already facing a garnishment. They're trying to find a way to get us off their back. So they ask for a payment plan. And they're willing to make an upfront payment to get into the, the, the plan, get it started. And then we're not gonna see money for a while after that, right? They're gonna string along as long as they can. We follow back up with them. We get the story about my health, my job, my family another bill that came through. We get the negotiations. Well, could you wait till mid-month or next month? Or can we give you a half payment? And when we haggle and go through this whole process, and you finally get money, and then you're waiting, <laughs> and you're calling them up, and you're listening to the story, and you're doing the haggling process. And obviously, this involves a lot of time and resources from our staff, and the money's not flowing in. The other issue is folks that are intent on paying. They plan to pay. But the reason that they're um, delinquent on taxes to begin with is they have poor financial management skills. When it comes time to write the check, the money is not there. They haven't planned, they haven't prepared, they forget. And it's not that they're trying to, to play a game with us, they just aren't managing well. And so what we did to address both concerns is we said, you know, if you want a payment plan, then we need to set up an automated uh, bank draft. And every month, that dollar figure we agreed on is coming out. Well, now, the moment we did that, the folks that want to play are not interested. In fact, we had a number of folks that would get very upset. I can't believe you would ask me to do that. But my philosophy is they were not going to pay to begin with, and so they weren't going to set that up with us. Uh, the other folks that are just having trouble staying steady, staying regular, sign up, and it helps them to stay on track. You know, if you've got auto draft protection, even if you slipped a little bit low, we still get our payment. Now they've got to deal with that with their bank, but that keeps the steady flow coming in. It keeps us not having to haggle with them, debate what time it's gonna come through. It's just set up automatically. And that has worked very well and helped us out a lot. Plus we have citizens that have never had a payment problem and they sign up for it because they like to have monthly payments. Let me set it up, forget about it, and every month it comes out. Uh, if they're on escrow, that's a nice way to, to handle it. And the other thing we've done, you know, every year I've been uh, up here, I've talked about the mass enforcement model. And we've just been very hesitant and very slow in implementing because in the mass enforcement model, you're basically telling the computer uh, if they've got delinquent taxes and you've got an employer on file, or if they've got delinquent taxes and you've got a bank account on file, get them. And the concern we have is well, what if there's a mistake? Right? What if we get the wrong person? What if we get the wrong amount? What if the person pays and somehow it doesn't get released off of an account? And it just it has made us nervous in the past, which is why I've been so slow phasing it in. But last year we went full on because we've been watching it. We felt that it was working well and it was time just to move forward. And with that, I mean, the first round of garnishments, you've got thousands of garnishments running at once, which is a little scary for us. We called it Project Godzilla. We said, you know, whenever, whenever it hits the mail, then Godzilla's going to come back and burn Tokyo down because everyone's going to open the garnishment at the same time and want to call the office, you know. But it was very effective. And again, I think that's one of the reasons our rate is, is pretty good with everything going on is that we got early enforcements out there. So I, I think we've put our finger on it. But then as of March 17th, uh, we had the enforcement stop. Uh, which is we recognize the hardship in the community. We recognize a lot of folks are out of jobs. A lot of folks are, are just trying to, to survive, much less have us going after a wage if they have it, going after a bank account. And so our, our take on that was to dial way back. And beside which we are very concerned early on what would happen if we had a COVID case. All right. So what I understand now, I really believe that were we to have one, within a day we'd have essential operations up and running. But back then we didn't know. 
I mean, it could knock you down for a week. You just, you don't know. And to, ha to risk having someone's account tied up and not be able to unlock it, that was not acceptable for me. And so we suspended enforcements. We did continue with a few really egregious cases. I mean, if someone hadn't paid in 10 years, it's not COVID related. There, there's a few <laughs> yeah. you know, bad actors. <laughs> yeah. uh, but mostly we stopped enforcement. So we did do voluntary payment plans. So we reached out to folks and we told them, we're not going to enforce, we're not threatening you. But these taxes aren't going away. And we, we can't reduce the value, reduce the tax, stop the interest. The interest is running. Why don't you right now make some payments? peel off some of that interest and put yourself in a better position on the other side of all this. And we had citizens that took us up on it and made those payments. Uh, surprisingly, made them a little bit too pessimistic because we had a lot of folks that did step up. Uh, so that worked very well. Now this graph is my baby uh, and I'm, I'm very proud of it because I want you to see what happens in the first two months. The red line is this year's collection rate and the gray lines are the past five years collections rates. And as you can see, up until the enforcement stop, we're out significantly ahead of prior years. And that's because I, I do think we put our finger on what those problems were. I do think we addressed them effectively. Uh, we talk about downstairs, when are we gonna have our 99% year? That's our big goal, when's our 99 coming? And we said, this is the 99, we've got the 99. And that's up until March 17th. And you can see from that point forward what happens to the collection rate. We just begin to coast and the pre previous years catch up to us. Um, I think we would have had the 99. Uh, but I want to show you this because our folks have done a lot of hard work. And we have addressed the problems. We have done what we said we'd do. And, but it's just a matter of being flexible with the situation, being flexible with where our citizens are at. And, and that's what you see in the final rate. Uh, the forecast, and, and, and this is very difficult, um, this year has defied all expectations. Uh, I've gotten to the point that I don't know what to expect anymore. Uh, what I do know is that the hardship is really uneven. Some folks are doing better this year than they were the year before, and some folks have been devastated. And because it's not a, an even problem, I don't have an even solution how, how to proceed with that. What I do know is we can't keep suspending enforcement. If we don't enforce, we're going to have a 95% collection rate. And we're budgeting at 98.3. We, we can't take that hit. So we have to enforce. But the other thing is, I can't ignore the hardships out there. You know, if someone's been knocked down, if we're here to serve our community, how can I ignore that? So the plan that I have going forward is to continue the retooled collection model that we have started this past year. I think it's effective. I think it's the best thing that we can, we can do to be efficient with the citizens' dollars. We need to do that. But ask our citizens to take responsibility. If they're in a financial hardship and they can't pay, they need to reach out to us. We will work with them. We can't reduce the bill. That's not going to happen. But we can set a payment plan that they can afford. We can get it down low enough that they can get by this year. And next year, we'll kind of reconfigure and try to get them caught up. But for right now, we can help them get through, but only if they raise their hand. If they say nothing, I don't know the difference. And we're going to continue forward with our enforcements in the coming year. Um, are there any questions about the, the settlement? Or? No? Other than the settlement, well, thank you. Thank how, how are you notifying people? What, what means are you going to use mm -hmm. to notify them of this potential payment plan? Should well, they be in that hardship position? Yeah. The, there is on the bill, but this is the you know the challenge with designing bills because we, we've done this a few times and redesigned a few times. There's limited space, and you're trying to figure out what to prioritize, what what needs to get out in front, and so it is a back page, right? If they read the back page, we, we say you know if you've got financial hardship, you know raise your hand, let us know, reach out to us. Um, we say the same, I believe, on the website. We have a few places, but. Now, we don't heavily advertise either. Right. And, and I will say, um, some folks are very good about that, heading it off at the pass, and some, um, I bet, will be me if I was in that situation. A little bit too much pride. 
and you don't want to say there's a problem. You don't you want to ask for help. Kick it on down the road. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and next thing you know, you're in over your head. And I've right. got sympathy for that too. So we come across a lot of times that enforcement. So they've gotten a, we don't blindside people, by the way. We don't tell the employer first. We tell the person first, hey, here's a 10 day notice, and it's really gonna be two weeks. Um, you need to reach out to us or we're gonna go to the employer. And at that point, we get the contact. And at that point, we get the conversation. So a lot of times it is on that back end, but that's still fine. If, if that's the way, if, if they'll say, okay, I got your, your love note, here's what's happening, we'll work with them. You know, if they're willing to work with us, we'll work with them. Yeah. Well, this year's bills have already gone out, I presume. The yep, yep, they've just gone out. So they went in the mail on <laughs> Thursday. And so they, they're already beginning to see the return back. <coughs> getting them. I hadn't gotten my, my Harlow set. I hadn't heard the, the white, white screen. So I'm pretty sure we the hadn't got ours. <laughs> yeah, I believe it's making it prominent. <laughs> yeah, it's on the, the front of the bill. That's one of those things we really wanted to push out there was the homestead. Uh, and that's one of the reasons, too. You're, you're always jockeying for what, what needs to be out there in front. And, and so homestead. I believe is on the, the front. Good. Uh, well, and basically, it's, it's a tag to get them to turn it over because we can give them more information on the back, but we have to get their attention right. first. Um, while I am here, I do have two other uh, brief items that we need to go over. Uh, one is the charge off of the 2010 property taxes. So we have a 10 year collection window. And as of September 1st, the 2010 taxes will become unenforceable. We won't be able to garnish or do anything to, to bring those in. So every year we write those off. Um, at June 30th, the 2010 taxes stood at $85,822.57. And I, I was curious, so I looked into our previous years. <clears throat> Last year when we did the write-off, the, the June 30th amount was 122000 The year before that was 146000 and so we have steadily worked that down to get down to the 85,000. So I'm very happy. We're not just focusing on, on the first year. We're trying to get the full range of years um, as we go. Um, but what I'm looking for is uh, the resolution of the board to allow us to uh, write those off effective September 1st. I will make a motion to the effect that we Second. let you write those off. Okay, thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by <coughs> Mr. Carter to approve the charge off of the 2010 tax. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Sounds like significant improvement over the yeah. last couple of years, yes. We're working on it. I'm working on it. Uh, the other thing is the order of tax collection, also known as the charge, and this is where the board charges the tax collector to go collect the revenue and, and most specifically empowers the tax collector to use statutory remedies such as garnishment. I know it's a long time until that season begins in January, uh, but there are some situations where it would actually um, begin earlier, uh, such as if you had a, a business with delinquent taxes or, or unpaid taxes closing down, you may have to intervene sooner. So we ordinarily do that at this time of year. Uh, so I'm uh, asking to receive the charge and go forward and collect. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion to authorize the order of collection by Commissioner Carter and a second by Vice Chair Carter and a second by Commissioner Boswell. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so question. much. Uh, and this may be just a Brian question, but is sales tax uh, up under your umbrella at all? Thankfully, or? it is not. Okay. <laughs> I, didn't think it was. I didn't think it was. No, that, that, that would be a Susan question. Okay. Or Andrew oh, or somebody. Jeremy, one thing come yeah. to mind. The, they've kind of postponed people with registering their cars. And mm -hmm. has that affected anything, do you think, on the collection on vehicle taxes? Yes, because they, they have an additional five months uh, at, at no penalty. And what they didn't do is they didn't move the next cycle back. So if somebody delays five months, for example, then they would have to pay again in seven months instead of 12 mm. to get them back on track. And it um, had and to affect uh, some on the collection mm -hmm. For sure. It, it causes it to dip out and then surge back. When we were looking at uh, budget projections, you know, we, we kind of considered that as a neutral because it'll cause a delay on the front end with more coming in on the back end, but in the same year cycle, not a problem. 
Well, what we do see is uh, purchasing behavior. There's a constant battle between the rapid depreciation that cars have and the purchases of new vehicles. When the economy is good, folks are buying new cars and it's driving that up. But as soon as things get wobbly, folks will hold off on buying a car and now that rapid depreciation is winning and you see the values begin to drop out. So that's the, the big challenge we face. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, the next item on the agenda is the site lease for the Satellite Tax Department. Well, good morning, Commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. You have in your packet a proposed lease of space for the Tax Department's use. Uh, the location that we are proposing to lease is the Medicap Pharmacy Facility located at 378 Harden Street, and it's actually in uh, the City of Burlington. The main feature that this uh, property has that we're interested in and the tax department is also interested in is it has a drive-in window for collections and uh, we talked with Jeremy and his folks we believe it would be safer for citizens uh, you know we have a lot of folks who like to come into county office building to pay their taxes I like to pay in person pay with a check uh, we have very limited space downstairs to do that in an appropriate uh, social distancing way that'll keep the citizens safe and keep the staff safe so we believe this drive-in window will be a really good option for folks uh, particularly senior citizens who want to pay in person uh, so we're proposing a six-month lease of the Medicap property that would be uh, starting immediately until January 31st of 2021 the terms of the lease are uh, $6,092.50 per month, and we'd be signing a six-month lease uh, to uh, acquire space in this property. We would plan to use the coronavirus relief funds to pay for five months of that lease. We know that we'll have those funds all the way through the end of December. If, I think it's possible they could be extended. If so, we'll continue to use them for the last month. If not, we'll have to find county dollars to do it. But to get the property for one month's worth of uh, county dollars for six months seems like a pretty good deal. And it'll also give us an opportunity to see what the response is and how valuable the drive-in window uh, feature is. We would also be using the coronavirus relief funds for upfit and operating costs of the property. So there has been some work being done to this property. Uh, we had to install, it already had a drive-in window, but the window that it had was an open window where you're physically touching folks. We've installed a drawer, so there won't be a very, very little physical contact. And we've installed a few workstations in the building. The building itself would not be open to the public to come inside. It would be strictly for drive-through uh, window service. Um, and I, I have a feeling once, I, I think this is gonna be pretty successful. We certainly hope that the folks that were coming in to pay will come through the drive-through window. I think Jeremy has put this information on the bills that just went out. So when the folks get the uh, mailing, they'll know there's an option to go uh, to Medicap, the old Medicap uh, facility and pay. And uh, it's possible that we will put some other staff in this space, but right now the priority is getting tax in place, getting the drive-in window open so uh, uh, folks can start paying their taxes. Um, if there's any questions, I'd be happy to try to answer them. We've appreciated Jeremy and his staff's uh, work with us to get, this, to get this in place. And once the board approves the lease today, uh, we're rolling. I think we've already done a little bit of work just in hopes that you would approve this lease. But um, Is there an option to renew this lease? I'm looking through it kind of quickly. Did you look I believe so. Uh, I think we, we went with the six months uh, because we knew we could use the coronavirus funding to do it uh, till the end of the year. But if it's successful and proves to be successful, well, we can either use extended coronavirus money to continue the lease or we may determined that we just need to keep using this property. I know I've had a discussion with several other departments that have an interest in some kind of satellite way to take payments for things that they offer too. I think the court system could be another one. So that's a good idea. I think yeah. that's a great idea. Mm -hmm. I think this will be successful if, if we extend it after the initial term, we'll find a way to keep, uh, to keep uh, the lease payments going uh, if it's something that Jeremy indicates is worthwhile. So how big is that building? I can't remember the square footage off the top of my head. We currently lease two parts of it now for Board of Elections use, the, the two uh, properties that are right beside it. Yes, but this was the main, this is the main pharmacy piece. So it's pretty good size. It's got lots of offices. Mm -hmm. uh, again, right now, I think we're looking at just a handful of staff being located there. But we could expand it. It's possible, yes, if we needed to. Or nice thing, you already have the drive through set up. I mean, it's complete with two windows. That, it yeah, has the one main water. window and then that's a vacuum tube for a second lane. Right. So 
uh, we feel like we would we would be able to accommodate uh, accommodate payments pretty well. Have you talked to the court system about this potential? Uh, just barely started those uh, discussions. I attended their uh, judicial partner meeting last week, and you know they're they're still getting their legs under them to get uh, all the courtrooms back open. And they have some needs. Uh, they have some needs for space that we may be looking at renting as they get back into uh, offering jury trials again. Right now. Uh, they may be looking at an alternative space to use for jury trials if they have a civil and a criminal jury trial running at the same time. So uh, the good news is the coronavirus uh, relief funds, all these uses fit uh, the, the appropriate use of those monies. So we would try to try to use those as much as we could to help the courts too. I would make group? a motion that we uh, execute this lease. Second. Okay, we have a motion by um, Commissioner Boswell and a second by Commissioner Lashley to approve the Satellite Tax Department site lease. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? <coughs> Thank, you. Thank you. All right, on to the budget amendments. Uh, Sheriff, you got a budget amendment? Yes, ma'am. Cox good. Grant. <coughs> you know, I come before the commissioners. Uh, a little over a month ago asking to be able to apply for a human trafficking grant for three officers in the amount of three hundred seventy five thousand dollars that grant has been awarded to us if the commissioners agree uh, to allow us to do it uh, that will bring a total as uh, we cost the county one hundred sixty four thousand nine hundred twenty seven dollars over the next three years for their portion of this uh, grant which would be a total of $539,927. What I'm coming for you today is to ask you to be able to follow through with this grant after the end of three years the county would have to pick up those positions for one additional year and uh, I don't know if y'all are aware of it but just this past Tuesday we arrested 21 different individuals uh, on this prostitution, human trafficking sting. And the most interesting thing to me, we had people from Stanley County, uh, Wake County, Guilford County, uh, uh, Alamance, anyway, far down uh, is uh, Pender County, I think. We had people coming up here. And I'm thoroughly convinced two of those individuals were probably coming to get these girls on heroin because one got arrested for heroin another methamphetamine that was with them to get them back and put them in the human traffic industry we are a crossroads because of our interstates here we need these positions because these individuals will do nothing but seek these human traffickers and go wherever they have to go in this state to, to get these individuals I'll make the motion we approve it second <coughs> Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Lashley and a second by Mr. Carter to approve the budget amendment. Um, is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank you, Sheriff. Thank you all very much. All right, we have a budget amendment from the Board of Elections. <coughs> Good morning, Commissioner. Hey, Good morning. Have you all are doing well? Before you this morning is a budget amendment that will allow us to amend our budget for $175,532. This is in response to some CARES Act funding that our Board of Elections Department has received. Um, the funds must be expended by December 31st. And as you will remember, when um, County Manager presented his manager's recommended budget, there was talk then of CARES money that would be available for the Board of Elections. This is part of the $186,507 that was in his presentation. Um, we are aware of a second um, HAVA grant that would be available to our Board of Elections that we are still investigating at this time. Motion to approve. Second. Okay, we have a motion approved by Vice Chair Carter and a second by Commissioner Lashley. Is there any discussion? <laughs> if not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Thank, Thank you. you Thank you. Now a budget amendment from EMS. <coughs> I want to fetch our EMS director.
while we're waiting on him, could I ask Bruce a question uh, concerning elections? What I, I read an article this morning about there's a real initial threat of maybe ransomware being involved in our elections this year. Are you familiar with we that article? We a lot of stuff from the FBI, and, and I mean, Kathy and those, they have an FBI agent assigned to the whole state. We've met with them before, and then before COVID and all this other stuff, just to do an evaluation of their current uh, roles over there, and it went really well about a year ago. Um, you know, the system they buy is completely separate and not hooked up to the internet. And so, uh, I mean, I, we've looked at it from our perspective, from the IT perspective. Of course, the state had a lot more, even higher up, so look at the system they got in place. Um, it's, I'm, I'm pleased with what it is. I mean, nothing's completely infallible, but the fact that it's not connected to the internet and they have all these protocols in place, I feel very confident in what they've chosen. So, Thank but I mean, yeah. you know, they're <coughs> constantly trying to get in. But if they get, you know, God forbid, they get in, they right. can't get to the, the machines or right. the system. Yeah. So I was just curious. I they'll saw be safe. That we'll be in trouble. <laughs> you know, that kind of stuff. But, uh, Thank anyway. you. I'm sorry oh. to interrupt there, but just okay. Okay. Mr. I thought Vipperman. I had a slow, slow thought. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. I'm here before you this morning to ask the board to accept uh, some CARES funding, some COVID funding, in the amount of $140,113.62. Uh, this funding was distributed directly to EMS Department from the federal government. And so these funds don't have quite as many uh, restrictions as some of the other funding that has passed through the state that the counties receive. <coughs> Uh, these funds were applied automatically and required no action from EMS to uh, receive them. Um, and so the funding uh, will be used to support EMS and our COVID <coughs> response, uh, primarily through the purchase of PPE, uh, cleaning supplies, respiratory equipment, and that type of thing. Uh, so with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions that you all may have. Does this have to be spent before 1231 also? I believe so, yes, sir. Yeah, that's what it says here. I would make a motion that we use these funds. Second. Okay, we have a motion by Mr. Boswell and a second by Mr. Carter to approve the budget amendment. Is there any discussion? If not, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, aye. thank you. Thank you all very much. All right, the next item on our agenda are the public speakers who want to be heard about non-agenda related items. Today, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, we don't have any in-person speakers because of our extreme space limitations because they're having court in the, what we um, call our overflow room. They call it a courtroom. <laughs> so they're using it. Depends on what time of the day, right? <laughs> yeah, so um, they're using that. So we don't have space, didn't have space to accommodate members of the public. So we had to reserve space for um, people who are here to present on agenda related items. Um, so we have uh, a couple of people who asked that we call them and then we have a couple of three emails, I believe. Um, I would just ask that the public refer to our public comment policy, which is available to be seen on our website, the county commissioner webpage. And um, when people are thinking about making a public comment, if you would refer to that, then um, that will help you with understanding what our policy is. So you want to go ahead and call the first person, please? Yes, the first person is Adit Santos. Of I'm Bur sorry? Adit Santos of Burlington. Is that a point of order to, if, 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 if it doesn't stay generic, and in other words, we talk about people talking about whether it's me, Talk Bill. About people. <laughs> yeah, is it a point of order if they start off of a track into that arena? I'm not sure I understand your question. <clears throat> if they start attacking a, a commission, individual, oh, right. yeah, is it not a point of order that that's to cease technically if they yes. if they're not on a generic topic? Yes, that's right. It's in the public comment policy yes. that yeah. you uh, let's see. from addressing individual commissioners. Uh, public number four, public comment is not intended to require the Board of Commissioners to answer any prompted questions. Speakers shall address all comments to the commissioners as a whole and not to individual commissioners. Um, speakers. 
that's pretty much it. I mean, yeah. I see. <clears throat> For myself, when people have said derogatory things directed toward me, I have chosen to not worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's either a point of order or, right. or it's not. Right? Yeah, that's true. And uh, I, I don't mind it myself, but I think uh, we need to be prepared for proper handling of mm -hmm. those situations. Sure. Is that okay, Brian? Certainly. Thank you. Tori's got the button. <laughs> Bueno. Miss Santos. <coughs> Miss Santos. No confront that. Okay. I hung up, so I'll try the next caller. Well, she said hello though. She said bueno. Bueno. That's about the only word I know. Bueno is this. Proceed. She likes it. Please leave your message for. This is Tim saying the call. Okay. So I wasn't able to get. Who was, who was the second speaker? The second name? speaker was Omar Batista of Burlington. Okay. Okay. So we have three written comments. And the first one is from Vaughn Johnson. Hi, I'm Vaughn Johnson. I'm signed up to give public comments to read today at the county commissioner's meeting. Downtown Graham is my epicenter. As father, me and my son have always enjoyed downtown Graham. From the soda shop to the muse, which is the only black owned business in downtown. My five year old son and I had never felt unwelcome or unsafe. Over the last six weeks, that has all changed. It started when me and a friend, the owner of the Muse, and a black woman decided we would go to the Beer Co. and have a drink. On the way, we were met with comments like, look at those N-words, and do they know where they are at? As a resident of Graham and a local taxpayer, I felt from that moment that I could no longer bring my son downtown. Now, I'm not sure how many of you have small children in your lives, but trying to explain to a five-year-old that he can no longer eat ice cream or spend time in his favorite area because the color of his skin is something no parent, cousin, uncle, or Alamance County citizen should have to do. I ask you as a parent, what do I tell my son when he asks me why he is no longer welcome? to save his allowance and spend it at the Graham Soda Shop. County commissioners and elected officials, what do I tell my mother and father when they ask to visit? Because I can't ensure their safety or promise they will be treated with respect. I ask you, our so-called leaders, to give me direction. You want my trust, earn it. Next, we have comments from Reverend Tamara Kersey. My name is Tamara Kersey of 1045 Camelot Lane, Graham. The last time I made comments to the commissioners was approximately three years ago when threats of pollution along with loss of land and property threatened the well-being of the members of the congregation I pastored near Saxbaha. Therefore, it is with deep respect that I submit these comments in appreciation for speaking once again on behalf of the marginalized, terrorized, and mistreated members of this community where their well-being is threatened. I am a child of an immigrant. My mother was born and raised on a small island in the West Indies. She has managed to raise all four of her children as law-abiding, contributing citizens of this nation. It is with this experience that I share concerns about the hunting and road policing of Latinx community members. 
While it is admirable that funding has been granted and, and is made available for human trafficking, it is also an immense contradiction to the trafficking of Latinx members of our community. Due to racial bias, demographic data for the Latinx community has been skewed to highlight risk without context. Misquoted information has been used to demean and diminish the value of human life, evidenced throughout the increased exposure to COVID-19 by sending detainees to detention centers. The stereotypes and prejudice of the Latinx community members stating that they all are illegal, illegitimate, is the same guise under which enslaved black people were subjugated, experiencing centuries of trauma and torture. At this writing, community members have been made aware that the Warrant Service Officer Agreement was signed in January without public notification. If this is accurate, these types of surreptitious practices, along with racial biases, contribute to the vigilante methods used against persons of color who are not a threat to society, but tax-paying contributors of the economic capitalism many of us are privileged to enjoy. As a faith leader and a child of an immigrant to the United States, much like all members of the Commission, I ask that you repeal this agreement for it is another way to perpetuate the stigma of bodies for economic gain and creating an income source for marginalized communities. It also <coughs> upholds the ideology that black and brown persons are second class, three-fifths humans with no right to the promise of liberty and justice for all. Next, we have comments from um, Yvonne Maislin. My name is Yvonne Maislin and I am a resident of Gibsonville, North Carolina. I am also a homeowner, taxpayer, businesswoman, U.S. Army veteran, and Gibsonville Alderman, Alderwoman. It would be extremely dangerous to defund the police. In fact, last week, Attorney General William Barr testified in front of the House Judiciary Committee and was asked if Antifa could come to other U.S. towns. His immediate reply was, no doubt in my mind, it would spread. In fact, Greensboro experienced significant damage to property recently <coughs> during protests that became violent. Windows were broken, fires were started, and graffiti was spread at will. I went over there and surveyed the damage firsthand right after it happened. My family has been impacted by this lawlessness. When my sister Beverly Ross tried to get her own windows replaced that are under warranty, she was unable to even get an estimated date due to the demand caused by the chaos. Police officers are truly the thin blue line that separates an orderly lawful society from one of chaos and crime. Thankfully, on Monday, July 20th, at the last Gibsonville Board of Aldermen meeting at Town Hall, our mayor, Leonard Williams, stated, I have not had any complaints about the Gibsonville Police Department. When I asked residents about interactions with the Gibsonville Police Department, I get positive comments. I am opposed to defunding the police. It makes no sense. I agree with Mayor Williams. In fact, instead of defunding the police, we should be increasing funding. In Gibsonville, we have a first-class professional group of men and women who faithfully serve the community. Our law enforcement officers assure fair and respectful treatment for everyone. They also have a positive, trusting relationship with our citizens and business community. Their stated mission is to protect life and property and maintain law and order. They endorse the values of professionalism, objectivity, loyalty, integrity, courtesy, and enthusiasm. And they walk the talk every day, all day. Their vision is to become the best small town police department in the state of North Carolina, and I am extremely thankful for them. Without question, we must defend, not defund the police. And that is all, Madam Chair. All right, thank you very much, Madam Clerk. Uh, do we have any commissioner responses? 
Okay, we have a county manager's report. So we do, commissioners, you have in your packet the uh, fourth quarter summary of information for county government. A uh, good takeaway uh, from, from this financial information is that uh, our health insurance fund, we're looking at it being in great shape next fiscal year. I think we closed out 1920, we believe, will be about $5 million to the good, which will take uh, cover our $2 million deficit and put us in a position where we believe we'll have possibly $3 million in our fund balance for that account. That's a uh, fantastic news for uh, employees and for county government. That's been something we've been working on for several years. Also, uh, to let you know about sales tax, uh, we've received the sales tax numbers for May of uh, this year, 2020, and it appears that there was a 0.81% increase in sales tax collected uh, for county government over May of 2019. So if you look at uh, fiscal year 1920 through the month of May, uh, as compared to 1819, it was a 2.1% increase in 1920. But to give you an idea of what we're seeing uh, happen during the COVID months, March, April, and May of 2020, if you compare those numbers to March, April, and May of 2019, sales tax revenue is down 3.32%, which is not much at all, frankly. This is very surprising. I think uh, you know we're, we're glad to see these numbers. It's good news. Uh, it will hopefully help account for any revenue loss we see that Jeremy was talking about in the property tax arena. So that uh, things appear to be doing pretty well. Um, we have seen, and this is in your packet, I believe, the occupancy tax, that, that tax has really struggled. This is our hotelier tax. Uh, after, um, it appears to be down about 15% through May of 20, which is to be expected. So it's good news on the sales tax front, great news on the employee health insurance fund, uh, all very good. And that's all that I have. May I ask a question? My question about the sales tax uh, was kind of going in the opposite way. Uh, without mentioning the name of the area, uh, you know, I, I, I think I left you a message and, and everybody else, I believe, that I went through an area where it appeared to, to be quite a few closings of, of businesses, not just for temporary until things get better. I mean, the windows are boarded up or, you know, papered up. I mean, they're gone. Are we seeing any trend in that, or is that normal? Or uh, it didn't appear to be normal to me from what I saw. It's uh, I don't know if it's part of the real estate boom that happened. There were so many uh, stores built there during the uh, the construction boom that new strip malls were built. Folks were moving out of one location into the next. It's not being reflected heavily in the sales tax uh -huh. data. So uh, it seems to me that folks are moving to or have at least through the COVID months move to online purchases pretty significantly right. that may hurt the brick and mortar uh, um, part of these retail industries so i'm not able to tell you with assurance that uh, what's going on with why some of the retail businesses are closing their brick and mortar could be online uh, and it could be just uh, maybe they're uh, not as competitive in our market i don't know well, one thing about it you just about can't get into walmart or into lowe's so <laughs> those guys have not been hurt by yeah COVID. they have not hurt that's uh, for sure some of the other retailers have but i mean it's been a boom to those retailers actually one of the biggest problems is lowe's they can't keep supplies lumber i mean they're really well, our, struggling our, our plan is to continue to watch how sales tax comes in and watch how property tax comes in all our revenues do and hopefully sometime in this uh, this fiscal year uh, the commissioner will be able to get some information about, you know, what what items the board might consider bringing back that we did not fund in this this year's budget due to the uh, projected shortfall. Well, I know there was a lot of discussion about the uh, youth activities, mm -hmm. but those are still prohibited. Mm -hmm. Right. So. It, Maybe not baseball <coughs> next year. Beg your pardon. Maybe not baseball, baseball in next spring. spring. Yeah. Yes, that's they true. might be able to play basketball. And hopefully they'll be able to play baseball. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hope so. And, and also there's the Special Olympics. Also there's some um, activities for seniors that were taken yeah, out. So, yeah. Yes, it's a lot. It's more than just football. And, and this football is, is plenty. This is a good sign. You know, we based our 2021 budget off of a 20% revenue decline overall for sales tax. And if we're looking at, uh, and again, this is our this was. These, to me, these were some of the heaviest months. April, May, mm -hmm. uh, we were, you know, March, half of March, 
all of April, we were in a pretty significant shutdown. Uh, and to be down almost three and a half percent, that's really, really good news. So hopefully uh, the sales tax revenue will, if it comes in better than the 20% decline and, say, and property tax holds in some uh, predictable way, then the board can talk about what it uh, might be brought by. That good, some good, good news. Yes, good news. Thank you. Do we have any uh, commissioner comments today? I have um, one thing, um, Commissioner or Vice Chair Carter and I serve on the recovery loan program. Mm -hmm. The county took uh, $200,000 from our CARES Act funding, our corona relief, our coronavirus relief funds, and we put them aside for um, loans for small businesses in Alamance County that have been impacted by the virus. And we went into a partnership with the Alamance Chamber of Commerce and the Alamance Community Foundation, and we've been working with them and um, the Small Business Center at ACC and the Self-Help Credit Union in Guilford County to put together a loan program to help businesses that have been severely impacted by the COVID shutdown. And today is the day that the um, portal opens so people can apply for the funds. So that is really exciting and great. And people who want to apply for their business, if you go to the Alamance Chamber of Commerce website, which is alamancechamber.com, and then you click on the Economic Development tab, and then there's a Recovery Loan Program tab. And so you open that up, and it will tell you what you need to know. There's no application fee or origination fee. There's no payments due for the first six months. If you need deferral, the interest rate is 4%. Um, and then there's also a flyer that you can pull up. You can borrow up to $25,000. You have to have been in business before COVID-19 hit, and your primary place of business is in Alamance County. Um, this board, the Board of Commissioners, had recommended when we set aside this $200,000, we discussed and recognized that oftentimes the minority and women-owned businesses were... Um, so especially impacted by the virus because they tend to tended to be smaller businesses that maybe were hair salons, barber shops, gyms, um, personal fitness, personal care places, often are minority or women-owned businesses. Um, the business can use the money for a recovery from the economic costs of COVID-19, including working capital, business rent or mortgage, employee or independent contractor pay, business redesign equipment, restocking of inventory, PPE purchases, and other costs of reopening for business in compliance with COVID-19 requirements. So that is happening right now. So please if, uh, help us get the word out and we want people to be aware of this. It's $200,000 of county money right now. Um, it, if the maximum grant's twenty-five thousand dollars, and it's not going to go that far. But you know, small it, business it means a lot. It means yeah. an awful lot. I've talked to quite a few small business owners who are really struggling, really, really struggling, and it's it's heart wrenching to hear what that you know how this is. In, they've been shut down for four or five months. They shut down March, April, May, June, July. This is the sixth month we're going on now that their business has been shut down for some of them. Um, like the, um, the gyms and bars and things like that. So um, it, may, it may be that the board will decide to put more money into it from the, we got another three million plus of CARES Act funds. So if this program is a big success, and it's demonstrated that the need is really there, that maybe this board will decide to put some more money into it. Um, okay, so that's all I had. Anybody else? Okay. Then we'll, I move that we go now, we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina, <coughs> excuse me, general statute section 143-318.A113 in order to preserve the attorney-client privilege between the county attorney and the board and receive a report regarding the claims made in the case entitled NAACP et al. versus Graham et al. 
And I also move that we now go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute Section 143-318.11A6 to consider a personnel matter. Second. We have a motion and a second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay. So, um... Turn the mic on. <laughs> Name. <laughs> <What's up? laughs> I make a. Does anybody want to make a motion? We re-enter open so session. Moved. Second. We have a motion and a second to re-enter open session. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Um, the statement to the public after the closed session: one, the board received a report from the county attorney concerning the case, and two, regarding the personnel matter, no action was taken. So all the business before the board being concluded will be adjourned. Thank you for watching the Alamance County Commissioners meeting. Meetings of the Alamance County Board of Commissioners occur on the first and third Monday of every month in the Commissioners Chambers at the County Office Building at 124 West Elm Street in Grand. Typically the first meeting of the month occurs at 9 a.m. and the second meeting occurs at 7 p.m. Changes to the meeting schedule will be posted on the county website at www.alamance-nc.com. The video of this meeting is broadcast on LocalGov TV. Please go to www.localgovtvnc.com for more information about this schedule and to see more videos produced by your local governments. You can also access this meeting through our website at www.alamance-nc.com or at our YouTube channel. Technical questions regarding this meeting's broadcast or production may be sent to our county webmaster at webmaster at alamance-nc.com. This address is for technical questions only. Comments and questions about the content of the meeting may be made to the commissioners themselves. You can find their contact information at the Alamance County website at www.alamance-nc.com. There, you can click on the link that says County Commissioners to learn more about our commissioners, read minutes and agendas of commissioner meetings, and find other information about the County Commissioners. You can also send mail correspondence to County Commissioners, 124 West Elm Street, Graham, North Carolina, 27253. Again, thank you for tuning in to the Alamance County Commissioners Meeting. Thanks for tuning in. If you're watching on YouTube, be sure to hit the subscribe button to stay up to date on all our latest video content. If you're watching on Local Gov TV, be sure to visit their website to see all of the content made for you by your local governments.